All right, well, welcome to the show, everybody. Um, so we are at the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. Uh, we're here with Dave Finneran, member 1065. Right. Pleasure to have you here. Thanks. So um, remember, everybody, this is a live show. So if you have questions for Dave uh, as, as we do this interview, throw them in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, share it with all your friends. Um, it's what the Adventure Club is about, right? Sharing That's stories it. of adventure. That's absolutely right. So you're... You're a very prolific diver, right? Mm -hmm. a, a scuba diver. You right. dive all over the place. Right. And uh, a, a treasure hunter of sorts. Yeah, very much so. Looking for lost stuff. Yeah, I look for lost stuff. And then I write about it, which gives it a, a certain air of civility to it because I write about it. But, you know, I still like those shiny, bobbly things that you find underwater. So Yeah. So tonight we're going to talk about some of some of these lost stories. Right. Um, weird occurrences that have been lost to history, for lack of a better word. Um, you know, ships that have gone missing or wrecked or uh, people have found stuff and trying to figure out what it is. And, and you, you kind of step in and you do the research. Right. And, and then, like you said, you write about it. That's it. So um, we're, we're going to start with a picture here and have you talk about it. We have a picture, Andy. We have any, any picture. Yeah, this is just a house. Well, it does look like a house. Actually, it's an Italian restaurant called Villa Terraza, but that's really deceptive. If you were to go behind this, um, it's it's like a compound, um, and it was not always as as benign as as, as it seems. Uh, right behind it is is like a, a a big garden area where they put tables. And then behind that, there were actually like cabins, small hmm. places for people to live. There was a room that used to be called the Blue Grotto Room. Um, and then there's some, some weird details about this property. Um, now to draw back about 50 years ago, when I was 15, I was a folk singer. And a, a friend of mine and I, who also played guitar, we started playing guitars together. And his name was Larry Barge, and we came up with the stage name of Dave and Larry. Not really that imaginative, <laughs> but... Um, and we started playing at this place, but back then it was called Old Vienna Gardens. And the first thing I started hearing when we went to this, like on Sunday afternoons, they were telling us that uh, this used to be the headquarters of a Nazi spy ring. Really? Um, Right, the story started as soon as we started playing there. So in between sets, I started moseying around this place, and uh, and I discovered there was from that blue grotto room, which was now being used like a like a banquet room. Um, there was actually an escape cave, an and escape cave, a cave, a tunnel that had been made where you could escape out of that room, go into this dark tunnel, and then it came out outside. Um, I thought, well, that was interesting. I'm 15, so I'm not a... What, a, what year were you What year were you 15 in? This is about 64, 1964. Okay. So and this is definitely, you know, post-war. Post-World War II. But right. you, you, as you're playing there, you're starting to poke around and, and some stuff's weird and you're hearing these weird rumors and you being a who you are, I guess, even at 15, yeah. you start asking questions and poking around. I did, I did. And then it turns out that up above this compound, um, there's like a castle on a hill above the compound, and they were telling me that there was a tunnel connecting the restaurant Whoa. to the... Do we have a picture of that castle, Andy? Uh, I do, actually. If you go to the that one right there. Yeah, that's actually the castle. Now, the history of this, I well, I decided, and it took me a little while, but about 50 years passed, and I decided, you know, I'm going to investigate this. Is it true? Were these just rumors of the time? Is mm. there some truth to the fact that um, there was actually a Nazi spy ring there? So I started investigating it, and uh, I contacted a, an investigative journalist who actually has done a lot of work on it. His name was Don Ray, and he's kind of a premier uh, investigator. He's done a lot of work on television uh, mysteries and things like this. So we agreed to meet up there, and I'd pick his brain. Well, it turns out he wanted to pick my brain. Uh, so I got up there uh, early, and I talked to the manager of the Italian restaurant, which it is now. And um, right, the first thing she says is, this used to be the headquarters of a Nazi spy ring. It's like 50 hmm. years hadn't passed. Same exact stories, the tunnel going up to the, up to the um, 
uh, castle up above. She did not know about the escape uh, tunnel. And I went over there, and she gave me the run of the place, and, and I went over there, and the, and the escape tunnel uh, had been collapsed. They had taken a bulldozer to it years ago, uh -huh. and it was no longer there. Um, but uh, uh, Don showed up, and he wanted to show me something. Could you back up one picture, Andy? Yeah, and this was supposedly the wine cellar. Um, and you can still see, even today, you can see that there's still little remnants of the original old Vienna there. Right. Uh, so Don and I went into the wine cellar, but it was, a, it was a tunnel that went way back into the mountain. I mean, a wine cellar would be, you know, maybe 20 feet long. This went way back. Well, we started talking about our individual research, and... Uh, August 1st, and it sounds like a date, but his name was spelled F-U-R-S-T. He and his wife and two sons uh, were German-born, and they moved to uh, Los Angeles area in 1936, and they built this. And that castle back then was called First Castle. And uh, as soon as the war started, there started to be complaints uh, from neighbors about this place. They said they saw armed guards guarding caves, that there was a secret radio room uh, talking to Nazi U-boats off coast. There was a weapons cache there. Uh, these were the complaints. And because they were just complaints, you wouldn't think too much. I'm sure there was a certain amount of paranoia in World War mm -hmm. II. Um, but then the FBI took it serious on several occasions. Three different major investigations by the FBI took place uh, about these guys being spies. And it was never definitively decided. Did they ever way. raid the place and search it? They or? did. They searched it and, uh, and major investigations, but they never uh, And they like walked down the tunnel? Yeah. And there were tunnels. Now this tunnel that supposedly goes up to the, uh, up, up to the uh, castle, I've never seen. No one can produce that tunnel. The story's still alive and well. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I'm not sure that one exists. But others do. We saw them, and like I said, this is more like a uh, like a compound. When you when you're thinking of a restaurant, you walk in the building and you have your food. The other thing, but then you, they've got bunk houses. But then also they have these tunnels, these these cabins and and secret tunnels. And that one uh, tunnel was completely hidden. The one that used to go off that blue grotto room. Uh huh. Um, and so. Uh, you know, you, you wind up getting the question. The tough thing about tracking down spies is you'll never find a form that says occupation Nazi spy. I mean, right. they're really obviously kind of secretive. Right. So I don't know if you can definitively say these guys were spies or not. Um, but Did they I, move to Argentina? That's a dead giveaway. Well, that would be the dead giveaway. <laughs> I lost track of August 1st, and so did uh, Don Ray. We don't know what happened to him and his family. I think his sons took it over. Then, for a while, Old Vienna um, Gardens uh, just was left vacant for a few years. Then this Italian restaurant took it over. And it's a neat Italian restaurant. It's a really neat place. It's just down in a place called Shadow Hills, just down the hill from Sunland to Hunga area. Okay. And so it's open uh, uh, today. But... And when it, you went by and wanted to poke around, they were friendly, about, and, and they, were, they were totally into the story? I told her I was writing about it, and the manager says, yeah, she gave me free reign of every place. I was in all the ca I was in all, every door that was unlocked. Yeah. And I have this problem that I think everything says, welcome, Dave, which hasn't <laughs> always planned out. And it hasn't always worked out well, but I mean, you know, so if, it's, if the door's open, I'll, I'll go in. So the tunnel behind the blue grotto room, is that still there? No, that's gone. That has been basically dug out. You can see where a, a bulldozer or tractor came down and just basically dug it out and removed it. Interesting. And it used to go from uh, that blue grotto room. Um, uh, if you're, that would be the west end of it. That's where it went out of. Uh, but when you were a kid, tunnel. you crawled down it. You didn't have to, to crawl. You can stand up in it. It was a big tunnel. Yeah. yeah, I could walk right. Yeah, I went through it a number of times. In and what did you say was at the end of it? Uh, one time it was my girlfriend at the time, but the, the was, other end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, but, but we won't go into that since my wife's here. <laughs> but yeah, I was fifteen, and a young lady named Debbie. I was dating her, and I discovered that tunnel. It was cool. But did it? Was it just a room at the end of the tunnel? No, or it, it, led the, out it went somewhere? from the uh, from the blue grotto room outside. 
it was a way of getting out of that room to the outside. So it's presumably the spies could hang out in their, in their little Have their meeting room in, in the their back, secret and room. And if they need to bail out. They got a secret exit. I mean, I don't know what else would that would be. I, I mean, that would mo- maybe be the mobsters, question. you know. Yeah, that would be the question is what else would it be? Yeah. Uh, the other thing, I talked to Roy Roush, who's a member here, and I asked him about, because, you know, I wasn't alive in World War II. I asked him, what about Nazi spies uh, in L.A. area? And he was talking about, he said it was really common. There was a lot of Nazi sympathizers in the area in the 30s and mm-hmm. even into World War II. Uh, I did a lot of research on other spy rings, and there was a lot of spy rings. The ones I mainly found uh, had been discovered on the East Coast, and a German U-boat would come in, drop them off. And, yeah. And another curious thing about this, those spy rings would set up shop in a, in a business uh, that was near a base or a airport or a defense facility. And this is is really close to Lockheed. In, um, in uh, World War II, Lockheed was just down the hill from mm-hmm. this place, and they made the P-38 fighter, which is the most successful fighter in World War II. Yeah. And, uh, and so where engineers and employees um, from Lockheed having dinner there, well, yeah, my parents. Good place to keep your ear to the ground. Yeah, and Nazi so it would spy. be a great place if you're a Nazi spy. And obviously, there were other bases in Southern California and stuff. Yeah. So, can't say it was for sure, um, but it is. It, it is suspect. Have you seen the movie Hail Caesar? I haven't. Uh, I think yeah. you should watch it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. It's, well, it, uh, it's about a Nazi spy ring in Los Angeles. They yeah. Kidnapped George Clooney. Okay. Um, you know, and he, well, I didn't see George there, but it would have been cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this probably was the real deal, and and that story, like I said, it wasn't like a rumor. You know, I've heard rumors doing research and stuff. People will tell you rumors, and there's a lot of questions. Well, maybe this happened, maybe that. This story was always told like this is the history of the place, mm-hmm. including the new manager that I just spoke to recently. And then you had a personal connection because you played there. I did, and that's why Don Ray wanted to talk to me because he hadn't heard about that other tunnel, and I showed him where it was. So is that was yeah. that one of the first experiences that you had that really got you into like, uh, not treasure hunting, but like investigating oh, strange strange places? No, that st- start, uh, when started I was, way before you were yeah, fifteen. When I was about. Uh, yeah, when I was about 12, I started skin diving, and I'd find some little old man-made thing, and I'd bring it home, and also, and I'd, in my mind, I had a whole story about this yeah. this thing, until it started smelling, and then it disappeared. I think my mom had something to do with it. But. <laughs> Dave brought another thing out of the ocean again, and it yeah, stinks, so we got to get this yeah. thing out of the house. And they, they disappeared after a while. Okay. But yeah. Right. Cool. Well, uh, let's see this next picture. Okay. Yes, this one. Yeah, this is the Explorer, and the interesting thing, and, and I don't know why, I, uh, like I said, I like tracking down things, and I decided, uh, I found a couple of landings in on the Colorado River. What do you uh, mean by landing? Well, where river boats used to tie up, there used to be a landing there, they'd load, unload And it's like goods. a pier, or like what, what exists? Perhaps still? it was at one time, or it was a place where they can tuck, tuck into the dredge little cove out where they can tuck a boat into. So this, if you can pop that up again, just so everybody, this is a river boat. Well, that's a river boat, that's an early one, but this is different. Um, the Colorado, a lot of people don't know, but starting about 1855, the Colorado River had a lot of a uh, lot of river steamers on it. It's the only way that they that they could supply the mines, and there was Fort Mojave and and ranches up the river. Huh. Uh, the railroad didn't connect with Yuma until I think it was 1872. So literally, they would go from San Francisco down to San Diego. Uh, load boats like the Newburn, the ship Newburn, which actually is wrecked off Palos Verdes. And that would go all the way down the Baja Peninsula up the Sea of Cortez, and it would unload at a landing called Port Isabel. They would go all the way around the peninsula? Right, all they the way down like the... They wouldn't like portage or whatever, like no. ship it across land? No, they would sail all the way down the Baja Peninsula around the point, come up the full length of the Sea of Cortez, which is about a thousand miles. Yeah. Know? And... Um, um, and they would unload on lighters, smaller uh, river boats. 
and uh, and then they would uh, take it up the Colorado River. So at this point in time, the Colorado River actually emptied into the Sea of Cortez. It did, it and it did. was navigable. It was very much so. And then what it, we this isn't anything to do with that shipwreck, but uh, in my quest to find all these landings, the hard one to find was Port Isabel. That was built in 1855 by the Colorado Steam Navigation Company, and they they manufactured and ran most of the steamboats up and down the Colorado. And uh, they were at odds with the Mexican government because they made basically an American port in Mexico hmm. and didn't pay them any taxes or anything, and so uh, that was the way it was. But that, that port was two parts. Uh, there was the landing itself, and then a couple miles away was a shipyard. And this area has 25-foot tides, and so they would utilize those tides uh, to use as a dry dock. And they actually made some of the riverboats down in the Port, Port Isabel uh, shipyard. The Cocopa was one of the riverboats they actually made down there, constructed. Hmm. So anyway, it took me 13 years, but finally Peter Jensen, Steve Lawson, and I launched this expedition where we had satellite photos, we had everything known to man, and we were going to follow these channels using uh, uh, using an inflatable boat. Then we went as far as we could, and we hiked the rest of the way, and we did find the the, uh, the landing site. And what remained of it? Not much was there. It was silted in. We also went to... A, but did you see, like, pilings or, or, or what? Like what Well, there was some stuff there. Well, we saw a dead guy on the way. Um, <laughs> like just a skeleton in the desert? No, nah, he was a little gushy, so he was newer than that. Um, <laughs> what? So it was just like a cartel thing, what they dumped, or, or like you know, I don't, I don't know who he was, but we were hiking. The three of us were hiking, and Steve Lawson says, "Do you see that up ahead?" And you got to envision this place. That Colorado Delta is the worst place known to man. And you, when we were there, we made sure we we went with a minimum tidal change because you can, this area would get swept by twenty five foot tides mm-hmm. because we could go by boat part of the way. Then we had to hike across this slimy, crusty stuff that you call the Delta. Um, and we're hiking along, and all of a sudden Steve uh, says, what, what, what's that ahead? I think, God, I hope it's not what, what it looks like, you know. Well, sure enough, it was a guy who, who uh, drowned somewhere in the Sea of Cortez, and probably, I talked to my daughter-in-law, who's a PhD biologist, and she said it looks like he'd been there a couple of months, but um, it kind of, those tides had washed him up there. And, are you supposed to report that to someone? We did report it. Now, one thing, um, let's see, this is recorded, so how much do I want to say here? As much as you want. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's the Adventurers Club. Um, we did report it. I didn't want to report it in Mexico. The last thing I want to do, because these guys aren't going to come out where we were. This is the hardest place to get to that I've ever been. Um, you know, in other words, uh, we were covered with mud. I mean, it was just terrible. By the time we actually got this far, it, it was, it's a really a tough place to, uh, to travel. Um, and you got to do it very carefully. Nobody was going out there. So we did report it, but we re- uh, Steve reported it when we got back to the United States. Hmm. Um, I don't think it mattered. No one went out there, but we reported it. Well, anyway, just past him was the Latin Long. I got the Latin Long of Port Isabel off a of 1870s chart. And... Um, some friends of mine at a California wreck diver meeting, they brought this antique chart, and they say, well, you know, isn't this neat? They bought it, you know, just for an antique. But I lined uh, napkins up and got the Latin long because Port Isabel was written on that chart. Oh, that's cool. So I got the Latin long from, from that, and with those numbers, we plugged in GPS, used satellite photos, we found it. And there was just some stuff laying around. So yeah, it was nothing there. It was silted in, but we were at the lat long, so we got there. But then we took another route uh, with the channels and went up to the shipyard. Mm-hmm. And there was quite a bit left in the shipyard. In fact, you could see the remains of the dry dock. There were parts of the Cocopa riverboat. Quite a take? few things. Huh? What would you take? You know, I didn't take anything. I Well, al- <laughs> right almost answer. nothing. But al- if you were going to take something. Almost nothing. <laughs> Almost was removed nothing. from 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 that. Now we didn't discover that. I found the log of the people who actually hiked out from the mainland side. Now we launched from the mainland side, but we went by inflatable boat partway. Then we had to hike the rest, and um, and so we went from uh, uh, from the mainland. But these the fe- fir- first people who went out there 
uh, to the shipyard, they hiked um, from the mainland. And I got a uh, copy of their log, and what happened is the tide started coming up when they were hiking back, and the, and the ground starts liquefying. And so it's kind of like you're worried about terminal sinking. I mean, this is liquefying, and so that's why we uh, had the tides uh, so carefully monitored mm -hmm. when we were there. Even at that, when we got back to our boat one time, the tide had gone out. We had it, and it was just sitting in slime hmm. um, in a channel. And so we had to push it, and we sunk down about thigh deep in the, in the mud, and we're pushing the boat, uh, seeing the tide just keep on taking the water farther away as we yeah. pushed it. So uh, just a miserable trip. And people have asked me to take them there and show them. And uh, I've been there, done that, ain't going back. <laughs> so that's terrible. amazing. So this port was the entry port from, from the Sea of Cortez into the into exactly. the river. And now, since it's just been wiped off the map. Yeah, basically. you're talking about these 25 foot tides who come there and it's just this whole area is flat with maybe an inch of crust, salty crust, and then it's slime underneath. But it's, it's hard to, um, the slime is slime perfected because uh, the, the mud has been coming down the Colorado for eons and it's been collecting, but it gets rid of all the pebbles and stones and impurities along the way. Hmm. So by the time it gets down near the Sea of Cortez, it's just this slime that you can't tell whether it's mud or water. It's just terrible stuff. Huh. And so, um, but anyway. Well, let's that, get back to that explorer. Yeah, the, anyway, the, the, the that's steamer. nothing to do with what I was talking about. Yeah, but it's <laughs> fascinating that that's uh, there, you know, and that you were able to find well, it. Well, there is a connection because the explorer Go, um, can you go back to that steamship? Yeah, that there one. we go. The Explorer was built in 1857 in Philadelphia, and they and they uh, dismantled it, uh, sailed it to Panama, crossed over Panama, sailed up to San Francisco, uh, loaded on a schooner. I don't know why they took this route. They loaded on a schooner, sailed it back to Robinson's Landing, which is just south of Port Isabel. It's in the same Delta area. And that's where they, uh, they put it back together. And so the history books, like I said, I've been following these things for a while. The history books said, well, it was the, the U.S. government's um, official voyage to see how far the river was navigable. And so... Um, but they, uh, had people, they had people supplying miners, like commercial companies they did. going up. They a lot, did. but this was the U.S. government's official mission. Right, they wanted to see how far you could navigate the Colorado River. Uh -huh. um, and so um, I decided later on, actually, for, for two reasons. I wanted to find uh, where this thing actually went because it went up the river um, and uh, it wrecked in Black Canyon. It hit a, a, a rock that they ultimately named Explore Rock after it. Uh, hit it violently. The boiler shot off, engine shot off, guys were thrown in the water, uh, injured. Um, and uh, so I got a hold of Ives' log. Um, and uh, and Ives was? Uh, Lieutenant Joseph Christmas Ives was the guy in charge of this. Okay. And there's a picture of, of, of the log book. And it was, but that, when I read the log, it told a whole different story. It's true they were going up to see how far they could navigate it, but the federal government was going, um, going to war with the Mormon church. And they were going with the up Mormon church? with the Mormon church, and they were going up there to see how far they could navigate to supply troops. Like up and, into Utah. Yeah, and they couldn't get that far because they wrecked in Black Canyon, and Ives decided that's as far as you could really safely navigate the river. That, that was his report? That's his report. But, I mean, were there, were there um, commercial enterprises going up further than that? Ultimately, there were. There were some towns like Colville that would be under Lake Mead. There's a town called St. Thomas, and uh, in my effort to find every single, like I said, landing, uh, it's, it's actually under Lake Mead, and Steve Lawson and I were planning on diving St. Thomas. And um, what we were watching is it was during a drought year, and the water kept on going down. So um, all of a sudden we decided, well, shoot, let's, let's walk out there. <laughs> and so uh, we, we found the, the numbers of it, the Latin long, and they call it the Lost City locally. 
And uh, so went, took my four by four out there and we started hiking and sh right off the bat we started hitting mud. I, I, I almost have a, a fear of mud anymore. I've hiked and sunk in so much of it. But we started hiking in this mud, but then all of a sudden we get out there. Well, here's all kinds of ruins out there. And St. Thomas is one of the farthest uh, landings on the Colorado River, which is it's now under Lake Mead. Huh. And uh, but there were foundations. Well, uh, when you found it, though, it, you said it's now under Lake Mead. Right, but the water was was low, and oh, so about half of it was it exposed. Was, we were going to originally huh. dive it, but about half of it was exposed. And so, uh, so a history lesson: Lake Mead was created when? Yeah, that's a good question. Or, I, or, or uh, generally, and that, by the Hoover well, Dam, right? Yeah, it was. And so, uh, so the Colorado River used, used to be able to go all the way up to Lake Mead. Oh yeah, and way beyond. And way it was, beyond. It was but long. then they put the dam there. They put the dam there, which created the lake. And, and, and they covered up some towns and some landings. With there, that. Well, there's quite a bit actually covered up in there, including uh, one time we dove the batch plant where they made the uh, uh, concrete for Hoover Dam. Huh. All the all the equipment is still underwater where they used to make the concrete and everything for the dam. How deep is that? Uh, it was it, When we dove it, it was about 80 feet. And so it's relative, that, that goes up and down quite a bit now, huh. uh, depending on what the weather is. But um, That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, that whole plant's there. We've got to get back to this Explorer though. Okay, we keep anyway, leaving the Explorer because the there's Explorer. all this other stuff that's going on. Yeah. Um, back so to you the got Explorer. the guy's logbook, you got the lieutenant who-, who, who Lieutenant who, Ives. He went up there, he wrecked it um, somewhere near Black, in um, Black Canyon. Black Canyon. And so I, d I decided for two reasons um, I wanted to go up there. Uh, first is I had been to El Dorado Canyon just south of there, uh, and I had been north of there, uh, but I had never seen Black Canyon, which was actually critical because I was about halfway done with this book, which takes place in Black Canyon. And this but book is? Beneath Blackwater Cove. It's a novel um, about a sunken riverboat. But it takes place in Black Canyon, and it's a and it's a fictional story. Fictional story, but you pulled but it, all these pieces together. It's a together. historical fiction, yeah. so it's a lot of truth in it. Um, but I wanted to make sure I was about halfway through that book, and I wanted to make sure some of this fit because I hadn't actually seen it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do is actually find the rock where the explorer um, wrecked using his logbook, if I could. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I got the numbers put together, I got the coordinates as close as I think I, I, I could. And then, um, uh, but the, there was a, a mountain called Squaw's Peak. And that was the, the one, uh, one thing we, we should be able to line up on because it wrecked right in, in front of Squaw's Peak. And um, um, it was a, we launched in Willow uh, Beach, and it was about a 10, 12-mile run down Black Canyon. And it really is an ominous place. I mean, when you enter Black Canyon, it's different than the rest of the river. It's just these sheer black cliffs, and it's pretty, pretty dramatic when you first enter. Do we have a picture of that? We do have some pictures of Black Canyon. And uh, that's actually the cove there. That's actually the cove. That uh, according to Ives' report, they hit a gravelly spit, and the, uh, after they uh, hit the rock, they pulled ashore in a gravelly spit. And we found that on the east side of the river. And so, but to repair, do all these repairs that they had to facilitate, they had to find a cove outside the current. Mm -hmm. So we went up and down, and we found this cove, which was actually ideal for it. I'm sure this is where they did the repairs of the uh, um, of the explorer, and. Um, and there's one more picture. And did you that. dive around there? Well, we didn't have Maybe to dive. Maybe some metal detecting. Oh, yeah. that is kind of ominous. Yeah, and that's that's Black Canyon. That's Peter Jensen, uh, my old dive buddy. Uh, Steve Lawson and Peter Jensen and I do a lot of diving together. Peter and I used to go down to Mexico every year looking for shipwrecks. Um, and uh, So um, how does this water level compare to how it was, you think, when this... When this uh, well, that's a really there. good question, and I think I think it was um, uh, pretty close to the same, surprisingly, because you can see um, y you can see old water levels, and so mm -hmm. things change, of course, depending on drought and storms and this sort of thing. And it was much more wild back then, but because Black Canyon is cliffs, it can't go too far. You can raise it or lower it, but the water's not going too far because it can't flood. Mm -hmm. uh, it's cliff. 
And so it's pr as near as I can tell, it would be pretty close. Now, Squaw's Peaks um, was very easy to find. It almost looks pornographic, so it wasn't too hard to find at all. <laughs> I mean, that, that was the easiest part of it. And then the rock is right in front of that. And so, um, but yeah, everything is... So you found the rock that he... That he, that he actually wrecked on. Wrecked on. The Explorer, actually, they rebuilt it uh, or repaired it, emergency repairs type thing. And they brought it back down. It was sold to the Colorado uh, Steam Navigation Company. Huh. And then there's a place um, uh, just west of Yuma where the river doesn't go north and south. It goes east and west. Mm -hmm. just makes this turn for, I think it was seven miles to Algodonas, Mexico. Um, and it was anchored in that channel and uh, it broke loose and it floated down to Mexico. It was found in 1929. Hmm. Um, uh, the, and so, uh, to my knowledge, it's still down there on a ranch in Mexico. Just sitting on some ranch. Just sitting on the ranch. That's um, your next trip, right? You know, I've got <laughs> plenty more trip, but that's getting close to that delta region that I swore I'd never go back to. Yeah, so but I mean, it's on some guy's ranch, right? Yeah, really well, I've got a picture of it in that book, and it's sitting there, but the picture is an old picture. Now I understand that what people have been doing. When you travel through Mexico, uh, people don't waste anything there. We found wrecked airplanes and stuff, uh, and if people know about it, there's nothing left. They, huh. they use the metal. My understanding, the Explorer, the, the metal, was of great value, and so they, um, they for cooking tortillas, and the, so a lot of the metal was ripped off by huh. locals to, to cook on. Interesting. And so, so how far, you, you spent a good deal of time on the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. How far can you actually travel? Like, what's the... Like if I put a boat in and I wanted to go up to Colorado. Well, you have dams along the way, so you can only go so far. And then you go there's, to the there's, upper. There's several dams. Yeah. And are they? Are, I mean, obviously Hoover Dam is the largest. Right, there's Parker Dam. That Parker. Makes Lake Havasu. Okay. And then there's another dam above that. And then I was looking for a, a, a river steamer wreck called the Spencer, and that's in the upper Colorado. And then you go up to Lee's Ferry. Have you ever heard of that? No. Lee's Ferry is where they, they drop in uh, the, the big rafts for, for rafting down the Colorado, the okay. big rapids uh, of Colorado. Lee's Ferry is, is where they put in. Now, Lee's Ferry, actually, well, I wasn't going to talk about this, but Lee's Ferry uh, goes back to the story of the Explorer because John D. Lee, depending on which version you take. He had 13 wives or 18 wives. And he was one of the main guys who masterminded the Mountain Meadows Massacre during those war with the United States. Hmm. And so he was hid out by the Mormon church at Lee's Ferry. That's why it's named after him. There was a ferry that crossed the, the uh, river there. <clears throat> and actually the, the ferry crossing is up from there. We actually hiked up there. We found the wreck of the Spencer, which is our old river steamer. Um, but we actually found the original cable for Lee's Ferry, where the ferry crossed, oh, which is north of where it is now. Um, and it's just kind of like broken in the river? Well, or? there was some remains of stone buildings up uh -huh. there, and there was a settlement up there. And then as you go farther south, the settlement gets newer into the 1890s. And the post office, I think, was from 1922. Huh. Uh, but the original ferry crossing uh, was up a little bit. But John D. Lee, he was being hit there. I think it was 17 years later, he was captured. And they took him up to the site of that massacre and executed him. And a little so, bit of poetic justice there. That's what they did. So, you know, but that's a whole piece of history that's kind of it's that's interesting. Great. And that, that town just, you know, used to be such a pivotal place. Yeah. And now, now it's just kind of... It's just the stone uh, walls are only about this high now. They're only a couple, yeah. three feet. It's just remains of stone buildings. But you can find history, and then you can go look at it. Oh, yeah, it's right there. It's right there. And like I said, the weird thing is that no one ever goes up there. They, they're launching a little farther south. Hmm. So uh, we got up there, and here's the original cable just along the bank. That's pretty cool. From the ferry. Huh. So, yeah, it's, it's, it was cool stuff. Okay, but, so away from the Colorado River. Yeah, what in the heck am I talking let's about? Pop, let's pop up the next um, next picture here. Okay, this is a Sybil Marston. And it I looks was, pretty close to shore. Yeah, it ran aground. And I was, um, 
I was contacted by some people and they had been walking on the beach and they said, well, we found a shipwreck. Can we see that picture, Andy? Um, I think it's the next one. Yeah, that's it. And we found a shipwreck on the beach. Do you know what it was? And so I said, well, let, let me get to my books. You know, I got quite a library of stuff. And um, so this I started was uncovered checking. recently by the sand. Cause well, th yeah, this is not always uncovered because if you look carefully at this picture, you see there's about a three, four foot cut in the sand. Yeah. So ordinarily this is buried in I, the up sand. Up on the top? Yeah, yeah. I can see that cut. Uh, it's buried in the sand. This is also taken during a minus tide. Okay. So this isn't always visible. But they didn't know what wreck it was, and, and so I looked it up just preliminarily, and, and it could have been, there's like 30 different shipwrecks in this area. And where was this? Uh, this is in a, um, one mile south exactly of Surf Beach in okay. Central California. So I said, um, so let me nail it down a little bit more. And so I started doing a little searching. And then there was one, one wreck that stood out. It was the Sybil Marston. You can back up a little bit and see the actual wreck site. And um, a Sybil Marston ran aground in 1909. It was a lumber scooter coming out of Grays Harbor, uh, Washington. Just carrying a bunch of wood? Yeah, lumber. And... Uh, uh, it ran aground. They thought they, they might be able to pull it off, but then a high tide hit and brought it up on the beach, and they couldn't mm. get it off. So then a storm came in and washed all the wood off the, off the ship. Well, the locals um, went down there with their wagons, and they, and they started taking all the wood and loading it up in their wagons. It was <laughs> scattered for about a mile, and they started loading up all these, all these wagons. So... Um, one guy actually started a lumber yard in a neighboring <laughs> town. And then, I guess it's a good time to go into the lumber business. It was perfect for him. God and sent so, me this lumber from the ocean. Well, and this was a whole ship full of this stuff. This, yeah. was, this was a lot of lumber. And, and so they, uh, um, I started doing more investigation, and it turned out that it looked like there were two houses that still remained that were built from this original wood. Hmm. And so, yeah, what's the next picture? So you actually hunted down one of the, th this is yeah, the house? Two, yeah, two houses. This is one of them. The other one was just, hadn't been kept up real well. And how did you know Supreme. that this house was built from that wood that fell well, off I that ship? I checked with, uh, you start asking questions, and this was actually built in, um, in Lompoc. And a lot of that town was built from that lumber. This, this is there. I found two houses that remained that were built from that lumber. This is one of them. Um, and uh, but there were a number at the time. There were a number of houses built from that lumber. Hmm. Um, but it was an interesting, interesting story that literally you have a shipwreck that helped build the town of Lompoc. Uh, this another weird That's thing about this crazy. surf beach. Just a sidebar on that surf beach is I think it's every year for about five years, I'm kind of trying to remember this, but the guys surf at the surf beach. It's not uh -huh. a real popular beach. It's, 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 it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. But guys surf there. But there was a white shark attack on one of these guys every year for I think it was three or five years. And they measured the bite, and it, was, it turned out it was the same shark. Every year, the every same year, shark the same came shark. down and got a surfer snack. Same month, same month, every year, huh. he'd, he'd nail a guy. Um, and I think it happened for three or four or five years, something like that. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was, they figured it was the same shark. Did so you I see didn't that swim. movie? What? Jaws. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, uh, Mom Puck should have shut down that beach, right? Oh, they should Every have year, shut the, that the beach. great white comes and, yeah. and takes one surfer. <laughs> yeah. Well, when we saw Jaws, what was that back in the 70s? I had a dive class the next day that I was uh, watching people make free ascents. Uh, and that, that movie was scary. Back in the 70s it was. And I was floating there watching people make free ascents, make sure they don't drown uh, all day long, waiting yeah. for the bottom half of my body to be bit off. That was Isn't the important part to make sure that they don't hold their breath? Yeah. 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 That, well, that's critical or they, they can die. Yeah. Because I know in the Navy, like they'll they, they send like the escape trainer, they'll send guys up with you that'll punch you if you, or they say they'll punch you. Oh, if they you, will. Punch yeah, you. if they if, yeah. if you if you try to hold your breath, if they don't see yeah. bubbles, they've got divers in there that'll come yeah. and jab you to get that yeah. air out of your lungs. Yeah, I worked on a charter dive boat on and off for twenty three years, 
and they used to teach uh, as part of like advanced diving classes, they used to teach uh, where you had to make an emergency swimming as ascent from about 70 feet. Uh -huh. Well, emergency swimming ascent, you take your tank off and you take your weights off, so your next air is coming, coming at the surface. Right. Uh, and the problem is, is that with a wetsuit, uh, it expands as you go up, so you go faster and faster and faster, and you have to go into a flare, so that by the time you hit the surface, you're parallel to the water, so you slow your ascent. Very dangerous move. They don't do that anymore. But I was working on the boat as a dive master, and uh, and someone embolized doing that. And so they're unconscious, and uh, um, there's all kinds of terrible just things you can have from expansion right. uh, issues with your lungs. But he came up frothing, bloody froth, and uh, typical embolism. And uh, But the amazing part is we got him in on the uh, backboard in the Trendelenburg position, gave him oxygen, got him into the chamber. As soon as he got in the chamber, he regained consciousness, and he was fine after hmm. that. Uh, he gets so, but that's not the norm with an embolism. It's a serious thing. Yeah. But that's why they'll punch in the stomach. You hold your breath, you'll rupture your lungs. Yeah. Or there's the all-time favorite of spontaneous pneumothorax, where you rupture your lungs, the the air gets caught in the pleural cavity and collapses your lungs as it expands. <laughs> so there's uh, all kinds uh, of bad things. Awful diving accidents. No, the never bad hold things. your breath. Breathe continuously. Don't hold your never, breath when never coming hold your breath, up. Right? That's it. You know, which I always wonder how, like, skin divers transition into diving, like breath hold divers. Right. Like, because, you know, it's the same environment. So they've trained mm -hmm. for so many years, like, uh, you know, hold your breath. Because, right. you know, that's what, and then now you start scuba diving. Like, do they have, like, instincts that are, that are counterintuitive? Counter that's a good question. I used to do a lot of spear fishing. I never really had an issue with that because the consequences are so grave that I think, you know, if you're going especially up, early on. I, I always think that the danger is if you don't know you're going up. Like if you're in a super yeah. reduced visibility situation yeah. and you're not aware that you're going up. That's true, you that's know? true, yeah. yeah. Steve and I and, and Chris Gilmartin, we've done a lot of limited visibility diving like in rivers and stuff where you can only see about a foot. Yeah. And uh, number one, you'll be swimming along and it feels like something grabs your leg while it's a pine tree. Um, and then while well, one dive, I was diving with a, with a Sacramento cop and a friend of mine who was a, a fire captain and found a, a van that had been used in a robbery and a car that uh, had a body in it. Jeez. And so people, you know, what you find in rivers is just ugly, just ugly. It's just so like you, so so you, you found a body in a van, in a in a car in a yeah. river, and the visibility was like two feet. Well, yeah. It, so it, yeah, it, when you're when you're in that bad of visibility in a river, it's pitch black. Mm -hmm. If you go down twenty or thirty feet, all that gunk blocks out all the sun, so you're using a light. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't see anything until you come uh, face to face with the corpse. Yeah, and then one time Steve, all of a sudden we were near each other, which it's, it's unusual actually to see each other because you can only see a foot or two. But all we happen to be uh, near each other and all of a sudden he grabs my arm and kind of pulls me over and there's a right or a left front fender of what I think was a Mustang. So you're kind of inching your way towards the driver's seat <laughs> to, to see if so you were at least prepared to see a body yeah. when, when, when it's inches from your face. Yeah. Like, oh, there it is, confirmed. So there was nothing in there, but Mike, uh, the, the cop we used to dive with, he, he said, well, you always tell if it's insurance fraud if there's only the one key in the ignition. Someone really loses their car, drives it into a river, there's their key ring on there. Ah, interesting. But he, he pointed out, so if there's only one key, it's it's. To yeah, get they took rid their house it. keys with them. Yeah, the house keys and everything else went. You yeah. Know? So, anyway, that's nothing to do with. What uh, let's move on to the about. next story here. So um, we just talked about Lompoc and how that whole town was built from a shipwreck, right. and now now you've got a picture. It's a blimp. Of a Navy blimp here. It's uh, L eight. It's Navy uh, blimp L eight, and this took off. It doesn't look like it's shape. It's not a shapely it's not. blimp. Well, we'll get to the bent part. Um, it took off from Treasure Island Base in San Francisco Bay, and that's the that's the island right in the middle of right. the bay that the bridges go to, right? Right. And it was um, uh, 1942 in the middle of World War II. And uh, they were just on a patrol mission looking for Japanese submarines. 
And it, about an hour and a half into their flight, there's two guys on board. There was Lieutenant Cody and an Ensign Adams. And uh, about an hour and a half into their flight, they radioed the base, said, well, it looks like we see a slick down there, an oil slick. We're going to go down to investigate. So evidently they flew down, um, and then there was no more reports. Uh, hours later, uh, they, the Navy base got a, got a report that this thing, a uh, fisherman was on, the, uh, was on the beach, and this thing came out of the fog, this massive thing, and it hit, um, hit the sand dunes, and it dropped something, which later was a, they determined was a depth charge. Well, the thing, the engines were running, and the and the blimp was flying along, and then it went to Daly City, a suburb of San Francisco, and uh, this lady reported that all of a sudden, every, she was doing her dishes, and all of a sudden, everything got dark, and um, then it sounded like chains were were rubbing uh, across the top of her roof, and then uh, all of a sudden, this blimp lands in the middle of the street. So the neighbors came out um, to help the crew, whatever the problem was. There was no crew on board. What? No, nobody. The engines uh, were running. The ignition was on. Uh, Cody's cap was sitting there, uh, and the, they had a briefcase with secret codes in it. That was still in place, but nobody was on board. It was flying by itself. What the? So blimp. this is actually a picture of it coming uh, near, uh, uh, near Daly City. And the interesting thing about this, you can see it's partially deflated. And the, the reason for that, or at least it's, it's, it's theorized, is these um, blimps had what was called balanese. I think they were called balanese, or maybe that's Italian sausage, but we'll call them a balanese. And Balloonettes? No, they were no. balanese or something like that, but they're vents. And what they did is if the blimp went up too high and it wasn't manually vented because you have a decrease in atmospheric pressure, rather than rip the seam or something, it would automatically let some of the gas out. So this had gone up at one point and some of the gas had been let out by these automatic balanese and then it had come back down, but it could still fly, at least barely over the surface. Now, there was a major investigation about what happened to this, and of course, the rumors just went rampant. Uh, everything from, of course, pesky aliens and you name it, and there, were, there was somebody had a story about what happened to these two guys. But these two guys are gone. They're gone. They, like, and disappeared the, off the face of the earth. Exactly, and the, the, the Navy's official report, which I have a copy of, was just inconclusive. They don't know what happened to them. And so everything else was just theories. Now, what happened is they took, they took uh, um, in the middle of the street in Daly City, they, uh, uh, the Navy was called, the cops called the Navy, and they put the thing on a flatbed truck, deflated, and they took it to Moffett Field, which was the big blimp uh, base in San Francisco. In fact, that's where the Macon was, uh, uh, was housed. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever heard of the Macon. It's like a thousand foot long blimp, and it had these biplanes called Sparrowhawks that would actually come up underneath and hook onto what they called the trapeze. It was like an airborne aircraft carrier. And they could the, land? They could... Yeah, they could. They landed Whoa. below the Macon blimp, which was huge. And uh, the, the original um, hangar is still there for the huh. Macon. Anyway, that's also nothing to do okay, with what so, I'm talking so, about. So the investigation just proved inconclusive. But what, so they fixed it, uh, they fixed it uh, at Moffett Field, they repaired it, and it went back into the service. But from then on, the crews weren't all that jazzed about hopping on here and was flying. They called it the ghost blimp. And, and to this day, that's the common term for the Navy L-8 blimp was the ghost blimp. Um, I actually, uh, when I was tracking this story down, what's the next uh, photo on that? Yeah, that's uh, Rose Leslie. That's Linda, my wife, and Rose Leslie. 
And she's, in this picture, she's about 90 years old, and she actually worked on the ghost blimp. Uh, when it was brought in Moffett Field, she worked on blimps, fix them, and she actually worked on the ghost blimp. Hmm. Oh, it was just a storehouse of information, just a wonderful older lady. But same thing. At that, like that's that's a first hand account, and at the time they have no idea what happened. No, absolutely no. And so what are, the top, what are the top theories? Well, you can. Uh, there's all kinds of them. One so of we got the, aliens. Yeah, okay. we've got aliens, of course. And then one was that the two guys. One guy was having an affair with this guy's wife. They got in a fight and both tumbled over. Uh, Probably tumbled the out. most likely. Of course. <laughs> the other was that they went down and they because they radioed, they saw uh, what they thought was a slick that there was actually a, a Japanese submarine, they were captured. I don't know how that would come about, but that was one of the theories. And there was a list of them. If, if you could just go on and on and on. Ninjas with grappling hooks? Y yeah, I just yeah, just endless sure. theories. But the official conclusion was they don't know. They don't have a clue. That's and to this, to this day, they don't know what happened. And like after all this time, like no Japanese reports came out? Like yeah. nothing? No, it no. hasn't been explained to this day. Now, Crazy. there's actually a caveat to this, that after the war, um, the Navy handed the, the uh, ghost blimp back to the manufacturer, who was Goodyear, mm -hmm. and they redid it, painted it, fixed it up, and that was the very first Goodyear blimp. <laughs> really? And people didn't know it. They were just circling the arena, and that's the ghost blimp up there. So when that blimp was retired, uh, Goodyear gave the, the gondola Two back to the Navy, and it's and it's in the uh, Naval Aviation Museum in uh, in Florida. Oh, that'd be a cool thing. So to yeah. So and what's this? What's this street here? Is this? Well, that's actually we traced down the exact. I, I went up and down. I had a picture of Let's of, see the next picture. of it in the street. Um, that's, Cody. <laughs> yeah, that's Cody Road from from Lieutenant Cody, the pilot uh, on Moffett. Uh, Even though Field. he never landed on that road. No, he never made it to Moffett Field. The blimp did, but huh. he, this is on this is at Moffett Field. But um, uh, but that street was where it actually landed. I I was able to match up an old photo of the houses uh, to the current. We went up and down. My wife and I went up and down the the street until we uh, found the right houses, and that's actually where where it landed in Daly City in '42. That's crazy. But, uh, so how so how do you find these stories? Just in in your course of investigation come across another one and it goes on the list of stuff to investigate? Yeah, you know, but stories like that are kind of everywhere. I mean, it's, and some of them you don't see, though. Like, if you were to Moffett Field and you saw Cody Road, mm -hmm. um, you'd have to look up who Cody was. Yeah. You know, uh, who's Cody? I was just mentioning when we were here, there was a picture of uh, Frederick Russell Burnham in mm -hmm. the dining room. And uh, years ago, it was hanging there. And I looked at that and I said, I'm going to find out who that guy is. Yeah. And so I tracked him down. Well, he's one of the most fascinating guys ever. He was a scout in the Boer Wars, um, scouted for the British in Africa. And uh, there's been a, um, a new book written about him called A Splendid Savage, one of the most interesting books ever. Um, and here he was hanging there, but no one knew who he was. <laughs> It's fa I mean, it's just clubs filled with fascinating it stuff is, like that. It you is. can do a lot of research here. Yeah. So sometimes just, uh, you know, I don't know, somebody will email me or, or something, well, what's this? I don't, I don't know what it is. So, uh, but it piques your interest and you got to find uh, out. And I'm a sucker for this stuff, too. Probably 90% of what I've uh, written about were uh, underwater. But one time, all of a sudden, I, I got a tip that there was a train in a, in a uh, lake in Idaho. Well, what's uh -huh. a train doing in Idaho? And so, um, you know, I figured, well, let me go track it down. And sure enough, the, I mean, Idaho's not the diving capital of the world, but I found the guy who actually discovered it. So I went up there and dove it, and I took my pictures back, and, and so I could t get a timing on it. What took the Orange Empire Train Museum, and it turns out it's turn of the century, about 1900. They show me a Baldwin locomotive with the same parts as I found there. Crazy, um, but you know, if you hear about a sunken train, you got to go check it out and find out right? what happened. You know? At least I do. <laughs> I do a sucker for that stuff. No, so. no that's, that's amazing. Okay, let's see this next picture here. So, oh, it, mm -hmm. looks like just another another, another house. house. <laughs> it's just another house. Just another older. house. What's up with this? Yeah. Well, this is Chaco New uh, Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. This is northern New Mexico, and. 
this is some of the, the strangest place. Number one, it, these ruins are huge and they're all over the place. And the people there, they're called two different things. Some people call them Chacoans and uh, some are the, the Pueblo Indians. And they're probably both. But this isn't Pueblo. No, but they call them the Pueblo Indians. At least of the Chaco. Pueblo Indians today call them Pueblos. But archaeologists, a lot of them call them Chacoans. So I don't know who they are. But they settled there and built those story about 800 A.D. Um, there were people in Chaco Canyon before that. They were hunter-gatherers about 6,000 B.C. So there were other people there. Then there was a group who settled down uh, and actually made some uh, rudimentary houses there about 100 A.D. to 700 A.D. And then these ruins, uh, or these houses, were built uh, starting about 800. Just a huge explosion of Yeah, but these are, these are huge. These are, I'm talking about, um, they call them great houses that were three stories high and had 700 rooms. Wow. Uh, and then they built these ceremonial uh, circles that were called kivas. There's one. Um, and uh, they estimate there was like 4,000 people living there. Mm -hmm. um, was this like an arena or? Uh, it was for ceremony. And, and there's also smaller ones where people lived in and they were also used for ceremony. So, but huh. it gets, it, this really gets weird because of the fact that um, there was about 4,000 people that are estimated to live in Chaco Canyon. Like I said, this is a big settlement uh -huh. at the time. Uh, everyone disappeared about 1300. But this area here has a very short growing season. One of their main stays of, for survival was corn. But oftentimes they wouldn't have a successful uh, season just because of a late or early frost. Uh, like I said, we're at 8,000 feet here. Mm -hmm. And so the question, first of all, is how did 4,000 people survive there? Now they figure uh, when you start investigating this, Everyone says, well, maybe this, maybe that, and the bottom line is nobody knows. Yeah. But the weird thing is the, the National Geographic Society started um, investigating and some digging around in, in one of the kivas in the 1920s, and they found um, Mayan artifacts. And so that brings up this huge question, well, Mayan artifacts, the Mayans were 2,000 miles south. So that's not exactly you come up to your wife and say, let's take a walk. I mean, 2,000 miles away. That you're, and they were trading with these people. When they started... Con Could it have been a, maybe it was an outpost or something? Don't like know. Like the Mayan Empire like, well, that's created a question. this... Out, this yeah. uh, that's a question of where, which way did they come from? Did they trade with them or did they come up here? They also found skeletons of macaws, which are a tropical bird you have in the Mayans. Mm -hmm. uh, they also found chocolate. Um, mm -hmm. which is, is from the Mayans. Um, they also found what was called uh, cylinder uh, jars, which are these cylinders which are identical to what are found in Mayan ruins. And so this connection, and then when they, uh, later excavations, they started finding um, uh, human bones, and uh, which, which brings up a question because these had probably been sacrificed which of course is one of the Mayan uh, rituals. It's one they shouldn't have brought north, in my opinion. But um, but that's one of the Mayan rituals. And but it sounds like the Mayans. It was the Mayans that moved up there and maybe established that. Well, that's as I would, opposed to the people that were there. Either got taken over or ha were influenced by the Mayans. And it could be, and it very well could but be. And I kind of lean that right? way. I lean that way. But the archaeologists say that they were the Pueblo Indians or the Chacoans and they were trading with the Mayans. 2,000 miles is a long way to trade, I mean, so. And if you're trading with a group of people and they're like, hey, by the way, we do this cool thing where we kill people. Yeah. You might be like, hey, we'll take the birds and the chocolate, but uh, well, you'd think yeah, so. we, don't need, we don't need those traditions yeah, up here, right? You, you'd think so, but they say that they actually traded and picked up some of their religious habits. Now, uh, some of this, there may have been a political motivation because these guys were run by a very elite group of, of the priests and governors, and they kind of kept the people at odds from their, from their secrets. And so the people didn't really know what was going on. Uh, and what their priests were doing. Even to some of those kivas, they have a tunnel. 
that comes from underneath where the people inside watching, they couldn't see it, where some guy dressed with a mask and stuff would come from out this tunnel. Um, and he supposedly was a god from the underground. And, but the people believed this because the priest told them this. And they actually had tunnels to facilitate this. Yeah. So, but the bottom line, what's so interesting about this place is that, um, you know, this is a huge place. It's hard to even fathom how big Chaco Canyon is as far as the ruins. And uh, it's everywhere. And, uh, but nobody knows anything about it uh, at when, all. When you think about that, like you told that story about how, how there's a tunnel that came up and, you know, a, a god from the underworld. Uh -huh. Do you think that those people actually believed it was a god from the underworld? Or do you think it was more of a entertainment thing and they just kind of went with it you know well that's a good question and i don't i don't know the answer i think some of these i i think you better believe because there's some indications that if you were outside uh -huh. of the norm in chaco canyon um you might be eaten uh, one archaeologist in particular believes that they that they had like witch uh, hunts and anyone who acted abnormally yeah. was a witch. Um, and they might have been eaten. And then to prove this, well, this gets kind of disgusting, and I don't know how they do this, but they found, like, thousand-year-old poop. And there's a, what was it, myoglobin, I believe it's called. They found that in there, and that's found only in human muscles, not, not and organs, like this person was but eating muscles. People. So the guy was pooping out people. And so that's how they actually proved that there was cannibalism going hmm. on. The question is whether the, the people are hungry or ritualistic. And you know, it's interesting they don't know. too because they, uh, how they find this poop, right? Well, I don't was know. It in a I, the first thing, uh, no, it was out in the ground. But how do you find thousand year old poop? I don't have any yeah. idea. Because you think about what's left over, right? Because what you, what you get in terms of human remains are the ends of the society, right? Yeah. You know, I wanted to put this in context a little bit. You said it started in the the civilization or the the big town mm -hmm. got built around 800, 800 AD, AD, right? And it was gone by thirteen hundred AD. It was gone by thirteen hundred. Now, it may have been uh, because of a drought. Um, but that's they, not. But conclusive. that's five hundred years. Right. To put that in context, LA has been here for about seventy years. Yeah. Eighty uh, years. Well, as it we'll is. give it a hundred years. Yeah. But like, um, like if we were comparing it. Like a hundred years ago in LA, it was nothing. It was Olvera Street, maybe a couple Next houses. To nothing, right. And now, I mean, there's an explosion. Yeah. And it's huge. Well, this was similar in the fact that for a long time they were continuing building. Mm -hmm. uh, you get, not all were built in 800 AD. They were continuing building. Then the buildings slowed down. Now they believe that some of these people uh, went 60 miles north. Uh, and they don't know anything about this. There's similar ruins 60 miles north of this, and they don't know the name of it, so they're called Aztec ruins. Uh, no one knows uh, what they really were called, but they're identical to Chaco Canyon as far as how they're designed. Hmm. But there's a river up there, a close by a river, and so they figured that some people went up there and started building another set of buildings take advantage um, of the river. But there was a river there, so they had water supply. And how does this architecture compare to Mayan architecture? Uh, very similar, uh, apparently. And I'm not an expert on this, just what these uh, these archaeologists say. Now, I, I will say about when you start talking to these archaeologists, they don't all agree with each other. They Everyone's got a different theory, so hmm. I don't have a clue. And that's the mystery of this place. Uh, the other thing is that after it was technically abandoned, it could have still been in use as a trade center or for ceremonies. Uh, one guy said that not only the Pueblos, but the Navajo cl uh, clan originated there and then moved out in 1300. Mm. I don't know. But nobody, uh, I'll tell you one thing, is nobody knows for sure. That's pretty and strange. How, huh? how all of a sudden you have Mayan artifacts 2,000 miles in northern New Mexico, and 4,000 people living in a place that can't support it. I'm not gonna say aliens here, we're not gonna go there. Yeah. But I'm just saying that that's the mystery of Chaco Canyon. Well, you know, we had, um, we had that archeologist in here at the beginning of the year, or 
last year, Kate Liska, uh -huh. and she talked about, um, what was it, the amethyst mines? Um, and it was kind of the same thing, but you had the Egyptian, like they, they were mining, um, was it amethyst? Andy, do you remember if it was amethyst or um, uh, lapazul or something? Um, a certain, certain mi mineral. I'm pretty sure it was amethyst. Uh, it was, whatever it was, it was purple. Yeah. I remember so that. So they were mining this stuff out in the middle of the desert, completely unsustainable. They had thousands of people out there. But what they were doing is they, the, the Egyptian empire was sending in supplies to that area. Really? And, as they, and as they investigated it, you know, you, you know this, is, this is this archaeologist. She's saying, you know, they're finding um, a little small pieces of the support structure to basically get water and food and everything else out to these, these slaves or whoever is running these mines um, to support the mine. But I mean, it's a huge, mm. co huge compound, right? Uh, with all the people living around and then in the middle there's like a, a where, where the officers or the people in charge live and there's a storeroom in there that, that houses all the good stuff that they pull out of the mine. And that whole complex is completely unsustainable. No way, it's just there to, to mine amethyst and, yeah, and so they're good. supplying it. For I, I don't know how many how many years, but it was it was there for a while. So well, I wonder if there's anything in that area that's like a um, like well, a natural resource. Is there any reason to be there? Well, that's another question: is, is what's the reason? And some of, there is a, a strange looking um, uh, a pinnacle type mountain that they hold sacred, hmm. or the archaeologists are saying they hold sacred. I don't know how they arrive. It's a cool looking mountain, I'll give it that, but there, uh, and some of the Puebla Indians are saying that was, has always been sacred to the Indians, so perhaps that was a factor. They did do a lot of trading. They had like 400 miles of fairly elaborate roads uh, for trading purposes, so they did bring in some things and stuff. Maybe geographically it was, I mean look, 5,000 years from now, people are going to look at the ruins of Vegas and be like, why the hell were these people out here? Yeah, you no, know, and no, no. I, yeah. I can't answer that question today, why that, <laughs> that, why that particular city is in that particular spot, you know? Yeah, that's true. But it's a huge, yeah. it's a huge development, yeah. you know? And that's the question. It could be considered, the whole area could be considered sacred, and that's why they moved there, and people yeah. were, st were coming there even after the, most of them moved out for ceremony. Yeah, or maybe you couldn't gamble in, 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 in Maya country so you know well, it could be laws <laughs> <laughs> who knows know. i mean well they, that's why vegas exists right because in california you can't gamble and and yeah. all the other states around it you can't gamble uh, that's it that, that's why it's there yeah. for, I, I can't think of another reason right well and so th these guys can come up with almost any reason um why this exists or why it just dried up and because, like I said, these ruins are elaborate. They were three-story buildings. They, they were That's elaborate. Crazy. They were serious buildings. So, I don't know. All right, let's look at the next set of pictures here, Andy. Oh, we'll, we'll put, th this, this is that same compound. Yeah. Well, that's my wife, Linda. We're actually hiking up near there to check out some, uh, some petroglyphs that were up on the hills. Does Linda come with you on all these? Uh, uh, not on all. all she, these trips? she she's been in way too many four by fours, canoes, and boats. <laughs> she's been way too many. And one time, uh, we were going down to San Diego, and I had a tip on where a, a Sky Raider had crashed. An airplane, Marine Corps airplane, had crashed in Borrego Springs. And so uh, I said, "Well, let's just make a little detour inland as long as we're heading south, you yeah. know." And and check out this Sky Raider. So, uh, you know, I got on the dirt road and we're bouncing along and I, and I really can't find it. I can't find the site. So I said, well, let's get out and you take this area and I'll take this area and we'll hike. Well, all of a sudden, uh, it was starting to get a little, a little later and it, it was about 108. And we're hiking out there and, you know, we got water supply and she's over there. Have you ever heard of Jumpin' Choyas? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I hadn't. And I don't know how these things work. <laughs> Nobody but, knows how they work. But also, they you get close. They're magic. Yeah, yeah, you get close to these things, and they jump out, and they, and they got these needle-like spines on them, and they attach themselves to your leg. Well, anyway, so we finish our hike looking for the plane crash site, and we get back to the tailgate of my truck, 
And Linda's got a jump and choya firmly attached to her forearm. And uh, so I took my knife out and I kind of scraped it off and stuff. And she's sweating because it's 108 out. And she looks at me and I thought for sure she was going to gonna say, you're my hero. But instead she says, you know, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's kind of the foundation of our marriage. She just accepts it. Well, what a dedicated know? wife. So you're headed down to San Diego, pres- pre- presumably to do something fun in San Diego. And cool. And relaxing and cool. Yeah, cool. It's 108 degrees. You take yeah. a detour. You make yeah. her get out of the car and start searching with you. Right. Yeah. You get eaten up by these jumping choya cactus. And they were which, terrible. I, mean, I know. They, they were terrible. everywhere. And they, 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 they're demon possessed. They, they really <laughs> right? are. Because you're like, I didn't step on this thing. How did it get no, me? No, they're all over your legs and oh, boots yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Wow. So oh, anyway. God bless you. So yeah, she no, she's been really a good sport about a lot of this stuff. I mean, and, but um, she she's an adventurer in old right though. She's a, a veteran rock climber, and she's got a pair of gloves, boxing gloves. She won uh, kickboxing. Oh yeah. Which when I mouth off, that'll make you think. When she <laughs> she award winning kickboxer. So she she's a she's a tough lady. So after fifty one years of marriage, you know. She, yeah. Yeah. We, but she's, she's that, what, sometime, sometime you're in the driver's seat and you're like, hey, let's just go stop here. All of a sudden, lights out and you're in the passenger seat. Well, <laughs> yeah. And you didn't make the stop. Hey, what happened? <laughs> yeah. No, she's not, she's not. She's been in favor of, haven't you? You've been in favor of most of it. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, she's doing Some this. Some of it. Some, Some of it. it. <laughs> yep. You got to get a take. Not jumping choyas. I got yeah. that. Ah, so. I know those things. All right, oh. let's see this next set of pictures, Andy. Well, this is Jackson Square in New Let, Orleans. Let's see the next picture. Just so we know. Okay. Ooh, a submarine. A submarine. Now, what happened in 1878, these guys were dredging this channel, uh, the, the Bayou St. John Channel. This and, is, uh, we're in Louisiana. Uh, just off uh, Lake Pontchartrain in New Orleans. Okay. And they're dredging this channel, and all of a sudden they hit this solid object, and they pull it up. And it turns out it's a submarine. And what year did you say? Uh, this is 1878, when okay. they dredged it up. So they brought it up on the bank, and then they didn't know what to do with it, so there was an amusement park right there, and so they put it on display at this amusement park. Um, they knew what it was because um, uh, in uh, the Civil War, uh, Horace Hunley, who ultimately made the Hunley submarine that's responsible for the very first successful attack on a Union ship or on any enemy ship, um, he was experimenting with submarines and he had built the Pioneer submarine. Farragut was coming into New Orleans uh, with the Union troops in 1862 and he abandoned it and shoved it into, into the bayou so they wouldn't get a hold of it. So they knew it was the Pioneer submarine. So it sat in this uh, amusement park until 1908, and then it was moved to a Confederate soldier's home to be put on display. In 1942, it went to Jackson Square and to be to, on display in Jackson Square, and that's where it sat until 1999. Um, in 1999, the state of Louisiana actually bought the sub and brought it to Baton Rouge in the State Museum. Who, who owned it prior to that? Oh, it was just privately owned or they just passed around. I don't think anyone really cared. Uh, no one was overly impressed with it. Really? So the state, yeah, the state, um, the state bought it other than a novelty like an amusement park. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the state bought it in 42, or I'm sorry, in 99. But yeah, it was actually, they couldn't even figure out when it was in uh, Jackson Square, they moved it several times because people didn't necessarily want it, hmm. um, but it was in Jackson Square until 1999. Well, interestingly, at that same year, a guy named Mark Reagan is a historian. He's going through a bunch of records in Washington, and he finds a, he finds a two-volume set called Louisiana Sketches. And it's by a guy named uh, David Stauffer, who was a, a, a Union uh, military officer. And it turns out that Stauffer was commanded after the, after the Union uh, took over New Orleans. Uh, he was commanded to take sketches, make sketches of all the ships, cannon, forts uh, in New Orleans. And so that was the two-volume set. 
Well, he, so, so Reagan starts opening this up and he sees a picture. Well, there's the, uh, a picture of the Pioneer submarine on the bank um, of the bayou. But it doesn't look anything like this. Not even close. It's like a pipe with pointed ends. And that's, that's more in tune um, with the designs by Horace Hunley because he, even the, the Hunley itself was like a glamorized pipe. Uh -huh. and, and this is like a pumpkin seed shape. Uh -huh. So all of a sudden they decided, well, we've been calling this, this uh, the Pioneer for, uh, what, 150 years, and it's not the Pioneer submarine. Um, as a sidebar, I figured, well, so what happened to the, the Pioneer? Or which and, submarine is this? Well, that's the, the big question is, what's this? Nobody knows. It's now called the Bayou St. John Confederate Submarine. But nobody knows. Nobody has a clue where this thing came from. And there's no records of any other sub. Are there no. candidates? There's no... No candidates, no nothing. And it's, but they don't believe it's, it's Hunley design because it's totally different than Hunley. But the Pioneer, um, they actually found plans for the original Pioneer and they found a picture. Of course, Stauffer drew the picture on the bank. He also drew a detailed picture of the, uh, of the Pioneer submarine, which doesn't look anything like this. It's tubular with pointed ends with a little conning tower on top. In fact, I got a picture at the, I think it's the Lake Pontchartrain Maritime Museum. Uh, some guys actually took the, the plans and built the, what the Pioneer looked like. And I got a picture of, the, of that model. So the Pioneer's still out there? No. Oh, okay. what ha That's the question is what happened to the Pioneer? Well, I found an article in the New Orleans Times-Picayune, I believe is the newspaper, from 1868. And the Pioneer was unceremoniously sold for scrap. So really? it's gone, it's <laughs> gone. So there was a Pioneer too that was the same design and that disappeared, I believe it was in Mississippi and that's never been found. And what this is, nobody has a clue. So that picture up there again? Aliens, right? Yeah, For it could sure. be those pesky aliens. I, I mean, look at those curves. Like you Everyone, said, like the, the, the Hunley and stuff was basically like a steam. Well, it was engine. hand cranked. But steam engine boiler, right? It was like yeah, it was a, a boiler tube, tube. A tube. And if you look at what's the next like, picture? The next picture is the model these guys actually built the plans. Yeah, that's a picture of the Pioneer. Yeah. Or these guys had a model, and it's a tube with pointed ends with little, right. two little conning towers. But this this other one is completely no, not so even who close. Is this guy? So so some some guys out there building submarines and stuff, and they definitely pulled this out of the water like in in 1878 is when they pulled it out. And everyone agrees that it's Civil War era. You can tell by the rivets and how it's built, the age of it. And what some guys did early on. Rhett Butler. Some, well, that's a possibility. <laughs> but some archaeologists, in, after right around 1908, um, decided to preserve it. They'd pour concrete on the inside, which was <laughs> questionable. And so when the state took it over in 1999, they had a restoration of it and took all the concrete out. And uh, it must have been a pain in the butt. It had to be. It had to be. An interesting story on that Hunley is, the, of course, the, the Hunley uh, took out the Housatonic, but mm -hmm. then was never seen again. Right. And there was a, supposedly the, the, uh, the guy who was in charge of it was actually a, a, a cavalry officer. And there was a story that his girlfriend gave him a gold coin um, for good luck when he went to war in the Civil War and he put it in his breast pocket. And he was actually shot. And that gold coin stopped the bullet and actually had a dent in it where the bullet hit the mm. thing. And that was the legend. That was the story. Well, they finally found, uh, found the Hunley submarine, and of course they were carefully draining everything, and the crew was still in there, but at the bottom, they found a gold coin with a great big Whoa. dent in it. So that's Where's story. that on display? Uh, on the East Coast. They're still preserving the Hunley. They raised the whole submarine. Isn't it crazy? When, when did they pull it up? Like sometime in the 90s? Yeah. Clive Cussell <laughs> looked for that a long time, and a number of people looked for it. But yeah, he it was just sitting in Charleston it. Harbor. Yeah, and they, in the <laughs> mud, you know, that mud just ab absorbed most of it. That's crazy. So, but what a find that was. But it's a very yeah. recent find. All yeah. right, let's see this next set of pictures. 
Okay, this is a PN9C plane. And this, I don't know, this whole thing interests me. Is this World me. War I era? Uh, yeah, yeah, that era. And um, in 19, it's actually a little after World War I. In 1925, uh, there was a guy named Com Commander John Rogers. And he was a submariner turned aviator. So that's almost a sucker of punishment in 1925. And he uh, decided he wanted to prove uh, that naval aviation was the future of the Navy. So he had this whole thing planned where he and two other planes, all three being PN-9 seaplanes, these are also open cockpit planes, um, three planes would fly to Hawaii and prove the, how successful uh, naval aviation is. So he convinced everybody that this is a good plan. So like I said, the plan was for three planes. When the time came in 1925, they, they were gonna take off from Chrissy Field in, uh, in San Francisco. So one plane wasn't ready. So it went down to two planes. So they took off five hours into the flight. The second plane um, had engine trouble and had to turn back. So Rogers and his five-man crew were on their own. They actually flew, uh, did pretty well. They flew uh, 1,992 miles, but then he didn't count on this headwind, uh, and they were running out of gas. So they radioed their base, saying we're running out of fuel, and then it was the, the radio crackled, and that was the end of any transmission. So they did a search for them, pretty extensive search for the plane, but nothing was found, so they just figured they were all dead, crashed in the water. You know, they could have landed fuel. on the water though, right? Well, and that's actually what happened, is they did run out of fuel, but they, without power, they, they were able to land on the water. But now they're in the middle of the ocean because they didn't make it to Oahu. So um, this guy Rogers was a great navigator, so what they did is took the skin off the wings and made a sail. Wow. And so they started sailing, and he was navigating, and they started sailing towards, uh, towards Oahu. Um, about seven days uh, of sailing, they ran out of water. And so that was kind of a huge problem because they weren't planning on all these days at sea. Um, so then, but a rainstorm hit, and they used the sails, which of course was covering for the wings to catch water. But there were chips of aluminum in it from the sails. Um, or from the original wings, uh, but he said that they drank it anyway. <laughs> you know, when yeah. you know, they were pretty hard up. Well, on the eighth, the ninth day out, uh, all of a sudden they saw um, uh, Oahu, but they were on the wrong uh, course. They were on the wrong heading, so they ripped up floorboards from the plane and they made a keel and they tacked 15 degrees towards Oahu. Uh, and then they were spotted by an American submarine on patrol that wound up towing them back in. And to, what's the next picture there? That is an insane story. Yeah, well, How? he's credited. Here's the actual crew when they got to Hawaii, which they were, they were heroes, but they're credited for the very first Trans-Pacific flight, Ooh, even I though the very that. end, well, <laughs> it's arguable because the last 360 miles was a voyage but they're credited with the first yeah. Trans-Pacific flight. I don't know flight. who was the first Trans-Pacific flight, but the person that actually landed in Oahu. You I think, think landing would, would be an important part. If I was the I guy that know. landed in Oahu, I'd be like, this, this is mine now. You'd be pissed? Yeah, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, I'm just telling That'd you the That'd be like, the, it's like, the, hey, the first guy that ran a marathon, right, he actually broke his legs at mile 20 and, you know, uh, wheeled in a wheelchair, which is admirable, but then the last mile, someone pushed him across the finish line. Did he run that marathon? Well, that... I mean, that's a good story. I don't want to make these didn't, rules. He didn't make that up. <laughs> anyway. Well, that's, they're actually credited, though, for the first Trans-Pacific flight. In the, I guess in the, in the sense that they flew across the Pacific. They didn't that's, make it to land. And they did fly across but the Pacific. It was a great survival story. Yeah. Um, now, we went up to track this down to where it actually happened. And Chrissy Field... Uh, is now a park, but a lot of the original buildings are still there from the, it was built in 1915. And where is this? In San Francisco. San Francisco? Uh, what's that next picture? Yeah, that's, that's part of Christie oh, yeah. Field. That's where they took off from. 
And it's now a park, but a lot of the original uh, buildings are still there from the, uh, from the uh, air base where, where he took off from. They fly now, under the bridge? You know, I'm thinking he flew under the bridge because it's a seaplane. I'm sure he's not going to get enough altitude yeah. to go over it. So um, where did that plane wind up? They scrap it? Don't know. I have no idea what happened to the plane. Probably got scrapped. Most of the stuff gets scrapped. Yeah. Uh, it had no meaning. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not even sure it ever made it back to the continental United States because um, he didn't make it to Hawaii the first time. I'm not sure who's going to crew it back. Right. What do you know it won't make right. it? Right. So uh, what's that next Make picture? sure you bring a spinnaker in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of Chrissy yeah, so Field. This is this is Creasy Field again? Yeah, Chrissy Field. And the, the thing that's a little disturbing, I, we hiked all over this place because it's actually a pretty big area. And I couldn't find one indication that this ever happened there. Uh, no plaques, mm -hmm. no, no nothing. In fact, I really couldn't find anything to indicate that it was ever an airfield. It's just yeah. a park with some old buildings. Well, you it. said he was trying to prove something, so that yeah. leads me to believe it was some, there was some politics going on. Well, I'm sure you there know, was so maybe, at that time, because you're talking 1925 yeah. Navy. They believed in battleships, not yeah. airplanes. So yeah. absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, there's no nothing I could find there to indicate this ever so happened. So how did you there. find out about what, what I, turned you on to the story? I don't know. I don't remember. Huh. That's a good question. How did I find That's out? That's crazy. I, uh, I probably read about something that had a mention of it or something. It's the very first Trans-Pacific flight. Landed his seal plane, is. his seaplane, uh, and uh, sailed 500 miles short of Oahu or whatever it was. Yeah, I, and so, but it's an, it's a great story. Yeah, you know, it's really a great story that. Uh, Did you he know, write I'd a book or anything? Of, not to my knowledge, huh? It's just in, in in some Navy report. You know, it's in it's some very nonchalant. Then I yeah. then I fashioned a sail out of the the wing right. material. We, made a keel um, we, out we drank of the... some aluminum chips. Right. Uh, we we made <laughs> yeah. we made a keel so we could tack and we. Yeah. Uh, eventually, we got towed in by a submarine. Right, and cool. and they yeah. were just they another were, day. Yeah, well, those guys were in some ways they were kind of tougher than most people. Yeah. what they accepted as normal was perhaps a little broader than we do. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, these are the stories that that persist. I bet yeah. a lot of people at that time were like, "Yeah, that guy's nuts. He's lucky to yeah. be alive, right? Yeah. Or yeah. he might have died." And maybe at the time, it, it wasn't romanticized, but now. It's such an amazing story, it and we is. look back on it, it and you know, that's the most interesting thing that happened in that time frame. So hey, that's what gets remembered, right? Well, and you look at some of the technology that these these guys were using. This stuff was real imperfect. These engines, these airplane engines, were not perfect. Yeah. And um, uh, and the calculations. It's not like, you know, the the two things I use when I'm exploring for something. I mean, you take Google Earth and GPS. Boy, those two things can lead you anywhere on the right. on the planet. Um, they had nothing like that. Yeah, and they and didn't so, have like weather reports. Like we, I mean, they had weather reports, but not not, not the detailed, you know, stuff no. that we've got going on. Knowing yeah. knowing where the headwinds are, what altitude sure. they're at. They didn't plan know. on this headwind that literally yeah. made them run out of gas. That's a yeah. serious thing. And but that headwind is very well known on the route to Hawaii. In 1925, not I guess sure. not. Yeah, uh, it, well, not not for an airplane in 1925, yeah. probably not. But that's one of the yeah. reasons, like, not a lot of planes can make it to Hawaii. Is that right? I'm, I'm only not only big planes can make it. Yeah, like it's well, that's right. Like little tiny like uh, Lear jets, like I'm pretty sure like G5s and stuff like that. Private jets they can't make Hawaii. Yeah, which is crazy. Yeah, it's a long flight. There's nothing it is in a between hall. it. It's There's a nothing hall. there. Yeah, <laughs> I ran into some guys. I was sailing through Mexico and we were anchored in Puerto Vallarta, and these guys had this little 25 foot sailboat. and There's like five guys on board, and. Um, and they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to sail to Hawaii. And I said, well, how do you pack that little boat with enough food and water for you guys? And he said, oh, no, we're going to fish along the way. Well, you know, you run out of most fish as soon as you leave the coast. You yeah. get some pelagic fish out there. But all of a sudden, one day they sailed off, the five guys in this little tiny sailboat to Hawaii. This is from Puerto Vallarta to Mexico, uh -huh. in Mexico. That's a haul. That's probably a 40-day sail. 40? I don't know. Well, you know who we asked? Michael Lawler. Right. Expedition flag last year. Yeah, I think, but I think it's usually well. It's he's got a racing sailboat, but I think in the average sailboat. No, he's got a month, he's got a he's got a big fat sailboat. It's not a racing sailboat. Boat. He calls it a racing boat, but it's real comfy. Oh, you can Is race it for is? sure. I mean, they 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 have in the, in the racing 
world, they have handicaps for boats. Oh, I, I didn't know that. But uh, his boat has everything on it. It's a very, yeah. very nice boat. It has all the creature comforts, yeah. you know. Um, but it's not, it's not super fast, but it'll get you there. And, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're racing it well, um, you know, your handicap will put you competitively That's with cool. other boats. That's like this boat that I was on. It was 57 foot, but it really had all the creature comforts. That, it was very nice. It's the way to go. Yeah, that was nice. But it is fun to get on those boats that are like all carbon fiber and super light. And they yeah, just, never been on one. They haul, though. Yeah, oh, yeah, they, they go fast. Talking, yeah, they haul. Yeah. All right, let's look at the next set of pictures. I think this is the last, last ah, little story we're going to tell, that's right? A, that's an arrow. That, that, now that just this, looks like a concrete arrow. It's a concrete arrow. In the arrow. middle of nowhere. It is. And I heard that people would... Um, would be somewhere either in a city or in the middle of, literally in the middle of nowhere, and they'd see a, a concrete arrow. And so... Aliens. Uh, that's the first thing in my it's mind. It's like those Nazca lines, right? Who are <laughs> yeah, those for? First thing in my mind. But anyway, so I figured, well, you know, I had to figure out, well, what are those arrows for? Now, these arrows are big. They're 50 to 70 feet long. They're big arrows. And so I started checking around. What they were is, is early on in the trans, uh, transcontinental airmail system in 1920, uh, all these guys were getting lost. Um, they, they couldn't fly. <clears throat> they, the plan was to fly across uh, country, but they were getting lost all the time. So they decided they would put 1,500 arrows uh, to different points, most of them going east and west, or they actually pointing to the east. So... Originally, these were painted bright yellow, and they had a building attached to them, and then they had a tower behind it, and they had a beacon on that. The original ones were powered, uh, were fueled by acetylene, um, and uh, then they had uh, red and green lights um, blipping out uh, Morse code to identify which which this was at night. And like I said, the, originally they were painted bright yellow. So I figured, I don't know, that's cool. I don't know. They were they built like 1,500 of them between 1920 and 1933. And they all had a building on them? Most of them did. They weren't as consistent as I think they originally thought. They were supposed to be uh, like 10 miles apart, and some of them were really far apart because it was open area and stuff. Um, but most of them did have a little shed. And later on, at first it was a settlement, later on there was a generator. And so that's what powered the light. And that stuff was stored at the shed. Now, I decided I needed to find and photograph one of these arrows. And there's some left. And the weird thing, which I don't know why, in Montana, they still maintain them. There's 19 in Montana that really? they maintain. And, you don't, you know, these became obsolete as soon as you had radio and obviously you got GPS and stuff. Right. You don't need an arrow right now. But most of the 1,500 uh, have been destroyed because they either build on top of them somewhere in cities. I understand there's one in a park in San Francisco, but it's all graffitied, huh. so people don't know what it is, but there's this big arrow in a park in, in San Francisco. This one, I, I had a couple of choices to choose from, and this one was east of uh, Las Vegas, and I figured uh, that's the one, um, uh, that's the one I'm group. gonna try to find. Yeah, usually I grab some grandkids, and, uh, um, that's and let's go look for stuff. And so, well, this had, a, we got there, my son-in-law is a honcho with a bank. And so he had credit at uh, one of the hotels on the Strip in Las Vegas. So we drove to the Strip first. Um, and so I got my th and three uh, teenage grandsons, Seth, Owen, and Jake. So how many did you lose? Well, I didn't, <laughs> we kept We're all. at the Las Vegas Strip, we got our room for free. Well, yeah. Grandpa wants us to go, go out in the desert, look for this concrete arrow. Well, <laughs> the first night we just took a big long walk on the Strip, and my son-in-law, Keith, uh, we're, we're right on the strip there. He says, well, why, let me get a picture of you and your grandsons. So he said, just back up a little bit. And I backed up and have my three grandsons with me. And he snaps a picture. Well, all of a sudden I see the picture. And it's one of those those uh, signs behind us stopped at a light on a truck, you know. It says, you know, for a good time call with <laughs> these half-naked women on it with me and my grandsons <laughs> in front of it. So I... I still have the photo. I mean, yeah. It's kind of weird. He just puts it, he's like, I'm going to save this for when I need a favor. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Remember he, that I have this. <laughs> yeah, he does have it. 
But anyway, so that's my, uh, three of my grandsons that's cool. and Keith on the arrow. And the way I found it, I found it actually using Google Earth. I had an idea where it was. And then I found it, you can see it from satellite photos. And, um, and it was one of those things where we uh, drove uh, past where I needed to be to the next off ramp, went across the bridge, then drove back the same way. And there was a wide spot where, where truckers would pull over uh, and spend the night sometimes. And so we pulled over there and there was a fence, but it was an, there was an opening. And then uh, we took this dirt road up past two things that kind of resembled dirt road, but weren't really, to the third thing that kind of resembled a, a dirt road. And I had satellite photos of this. That's why I knew which thing to go down. I mean, we drove down and I said, yeah, I think this is the one. I got my GPS and all of a sudden here's this arrow out in the middle of the desert, nothing close to it. That's pretty, pretty <coughs> wild. And, uh, so, but you know, it really uh, is interesting how things have changed. I mean, you really think about it, it wasn't that long ago, these guys, uh, instead of using GPS and oh, yeah. all this automated stuff, they were looking at uh, bright yellow uh, arrows. Yes, yeah, some of this, um, I didn't bring the close-up photos, but some of the yellow, original yellow paint's still on that oh, that's arrow. that's pretty cool. Um, not much, but there's little little scraps of it. So. Yeah, you know, pilot, pilots still do a lot of, you know, visual flight like that where they're just mm -hmm. looking at the ground. Not a lot of them use the GPS, you would think, you know, but yeah. I've talked to a lot of pilots recently. <laughs> yeah. And, and a, lot of, a lot of aviation's just done looking at stuff. But we got a lot of roads and buildings and sure. landmarks. It's a lot easier, you know, yeah. it's not. And, and I, I don't think a lot of people fly over open country as much. You well, know. I don't, especially the desert. But yeah, know, like you said, know, we've got radios now. There's, you know, the the um, the Vortac system and all, all that, the, those beacons that you can home, home in yeah. on, plus just GPS, right? Like yeah, GPS. that GPS is amazing. Yeah. It's, it's just the easiest thing that uh, um, to, f to find something if you have. Oh, we got another one here. We got a... Um, I think that's the last one. <clears throat> well, that's we a got little biplane. Yes, yeah, airmail. Oh, this is an airmail carrier for... Yeah. Now, that looks like a Jenny. Actually, I believe that to be... Uh, be if the tail is different than a Jenny, that's a, a air code to Haviland DH-4. So this is what they're... Fly, they're flying mail across across the country. Right, with these Jennies, things. Curtis Jennies and planes and like this. And following those arrows. Yeah. Just like looking out, looking down. Yeah. The interesting thing about this plane, this, this uh, was the only... American-built plane. Now, this is based on the de Havilland design, which is British, but it's the only American uh, uh, plane used in World War One in combat. Mm. It was built uh, by Airco, and it uses a 12-cylinder um, Liberty engine. 12 and, cylinders, wow. Right. And so, interesting, I, we, I actually looked for one of these one time. Um, in 1922, uh, um, a major who was a cavalry major, he was in charge of the cavalry, was doing an inspection of, of uh, the different cavalry situations at different forts. And so he had a pilot fly him on a Coronado Island. And they flew, uh, uh, were flowing, flying to uh, uh, Tucson, I believe it was. Uh, and they disappeared in 1922. And so, in fact, it was, there was the largest search at, of the time, even into Mexico. From and San find, Diego to Tucson? Yeah. Was and the they Salton didn't know Sea there in 1922? When did it fill up? 1919? No, 1914? Er, earlier than that. Earlier than that. It was 1908, 19, okay. something so like that. So the Salton Sea was there, right? It was. And they didn't know what happened to them. They just didn't show up. And, and but just another plane at the bottom of the... Well, that was a possibility. <laughs> and, and then um, uh, right after winter, the snow was coming down, and a rancher found the remains of the plane and the bodies in the mountains oh. east of San Diego. So um, they, uh, the pilot who was at a Coronado um, was really a pretty well-liked guy. And so these guys went up there and they took the Liberty 12-cylinder engine and they mounted it in concrete with a little plaque, uh, dated hmm. 1922. And uh, so I decided, well, shoot, I'm going to find I bet I can find that. You know, I had some idea where it was and stuff like this. And I figured it was going to be a little hike, you know, a little walk in the park and stuff. So I invited my grandson Owen with me. He's been a, a, a pretty consistent victim of mine. And uh, 
all of a sudden this trail wasn't a trail at all. It was a washed out path. It was solid rocks and boulders and stuff. And we kept on hiking halfway. We had to stop where he could tape his blisters. <laughs> and then we got up to it and it was overgrown or got up to the top of the hill. So we arbitrarily just made a left on this little opening and found that there's that engine sitting in concrete from wow. 1922. There's also other wreckage of that plane uh, uh, still there. This is there. just down outside of San Diego. In, yeah, inland San Diego and in the hills out back there. Anyway, well, I've just... So is that story in this book? We didn't talk about uh, this, the, this other book here. Well, this has got a lot about uh, Port Isabel and Mexico and a lot of Mexican wrecks. Uh, like I said, Peter Jensen and I have gone th extensively through Mexico. So if you're um, going down to Baja fancy. and to see a Cortez, yeah, that's that's the book that's to got, pick up. That's got some wrecks. And this is called um, Lost Below. Yeah, and that's my first novel. Now, there's absolutely no reason that's available on Amazon, at Walmart, every place known to man. And if you're really cheap, you can get it on Kindle. So there's no reason every member shouldn't have that. I mean, you know, cut me some slack, you know. I How mean, much is it on the Kindle? It's like two bucks or yeah, something. And what if that. you subscribe, you get it for free? <laughs> I don't know how I make money off this, but <laughs> so yeah, Kindle is cheap. And then the publisher, they only charge like 10 bucks for the book. I was kind of surprised because, you know, but anyway, so well, it's we'll a deal. We'll put links to these books in the description so people <laughs> yeah. can find them. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place, but this is my new one. It's my first novel. Um, which was hard to write because I'm, uh, my training is, is, is an investigative journalist. Mm -hmm. And I started writing a novel and all of a sudden I kind of thought, whoa, this is hard. <laughs> this is different. So yeah. <laughs> it was a little, uh, little rough. I had to restudy some things uh, to write a novel. But it actually uh, placed in the top 10 with the Adventure Writers Competition. Oh, so, cool. To my surprise, so, so it's worth the read. It's right? a good book, and so if I you guys, guess. if you guys are liking these stories, pick up these two books. Links That's are going right. to be in the description, so you can find those. You can find them somewhere. Um, so if we remember, this is live. People are still watching. Oh, um, are they? I forgot all about <laughs> but them. But we want to we want to devote some time to answering some questions. So I'm sure, sure that there are some questions in the chat. Um, be prepared to field questions from any one of these these many stories that you've given us tonight. So Andy, what do we have in the chat? From the chat, we have a few questions tonight, and uh, like you said, a lot of variability in the stories they're from. So first, I'd like to welcome everyone back to the chat. It's lovely to see your smiling faces once again. I hope you enjoyed the show tonight. So for, question, so for questions and answers, our first question comes from Rock Roll. Thank you for the question, Rock Roll. And, he, and uh, Rock Roll wants to know, why isn't the outlet slash dock used anymore? I think this is in regards to the Colorado River one. Uh, is it because too much Colorado River water is diverted to make it to the bay slash sea? Well, all of the area down that, there is now, um, I, I wouldn't say it's dry because you have those tides come in and they wash over the whole area and then they drain out creating these crevasses, these drainage canals. Um, but there really is is no use for a boat going up there now. There's no, uh, like I said, in Port Isabel where the dry dock is, there's still water in that dry dock. You can see it there, but it's like three inches deep where it used to be, mm -hmm. you know, where it used to be probably 30 feet deep. Uh, you can also see the channel that went to the shipyard, but that's about three inches deep. Um, in a picture in here, it shows we're hiking across there. As far as I can see, all you can see is, is three sets of footprints. There's nothing out there. This is vacant out here. And, uh, and it gets a little spooky, actually, because uh, it just, there's just nothing. And the mud could eat you, right? Well, th that's what those people were talking about, that we figured this. I figured it the best I could with a neutral tide, and I think there was a six-foot tide. Um, but this is my figuring, and so I'm walking around. They seem to have faith in my figuring, but I wasn't so sure. I just seemed reasonable to me. Right. Sure. <laughs> so it seemed like a good idea. Yeah. So no, I they think that's probably appropriate. Have a you more... know, the, the, the tide's as low as it's going to be. This is our yeah. best shot. Yeah. So that was, you know, so hopefully it didn't, because like I said, this stuff liquefies. And we had at least over a mile hike back to the boat. Yeah. So if this stuff starts uh, liquefying like it did on that first party that found the shipyard, um, 
you're you're hot and fo hot footing it out of there. Yeah. That's that's serious business. And there's nobody coming for help. You can yell if you want, but <laughs> not happening. Yeah, no, the, you know, uh, rock roll brings up a good point. I I've always thought it would be a great idea. This is just my harebrained scheme for them to cut cut a channel, right? Like Panama Canal style, like a big channel mm -hmm. into the Salton Sea to the Sea of Cortez. Right. And then you uh, some of that worthless land around the Salton Sea. Sorry if you live out there, but I mean it's No, I don't live in Salton Sea. You know, all that land out there, right? Uh, you can put ports, right? So you you can you can drive a giant container ship right up into the Salton Sea, right up north, and you can offload all those containers out there inland, and you can get rid of all that traffic at Long Beach in LA. You can move that right inland. Well, that's an interesting concept. I'm not sure of the elevation on that, because Lake Cahuilla used to be there. Right. Where you can see the water line from where Lake Cahuilla covered that whole Coachella Valley. Uh, and then what's that? Um, What's that bay in, in Mexico just south of there? Laguna Salada is just mm -hmm. south of there. And then when you go just south of there, that's where you hit the delta. And so the, the, that area was covered with water at, at one time, or at least part of the time, and probably a couple hundred feet deep. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure if you connect it with, uh, with the Sea of Cortez. I'm not sure what the sea level is versus the, the elevation. I think it's pretty, it, it, is it below sea level? Is the sea, Salton Sea yeah. below the surface? That's a weird place. I dove in the Salton Sea uh, looking for a, a World War II aircraft. There's like mm -hmm. 30 World War II aircraft. Yeah, in the Salton Sea, and I wouldn't suggest diving. Having been there underwater, it's did you uh, find that? Um, well, I, how would I know? I couldn't see anything. I, you know, virtually you couldn't see it. We had the numbers uh, for it, and we'll probably go back sometime. But it was Stephen and myself and a little inflatable, and then I volunteered, or maybe he volunteered me. You know, send the old guy off the boat first or something. You need an ROV for that. Well, it was zero <laughs> vis, and actually we had footage from an ROV. The guy we got the numbers from was doing a television program, uh, and they were using his ROV, and that's mm -hmm. when we got the footage. But we hit it. It was just a terrible day in general. But, yeah. Um, but it was zero visibility. It was uh, yeah. nothing. But. So an average day. All right, let's All take right. the next question, please. I actually do. That was a long time ago, but I, I don't have them with me. But I do have pictures of the 57-foot uh, sailboat I was on. It was called the Dorothy O out of Newport Beach, and it was owned by the credit dentist, um, Dr. Beecham, back in the 70s. And we sailed. We were delivering the boat back from, I think it was the Puerto Vallarta race, you know, but sorry, Dr. Beecham, we actually sailed south first. Yeah. <laughs> so it took a long time getting that boat back to Newport Beach. But it was a good, good trip. Yeah, that was a good trip. All right, next question, please. Next question is, what is the location you expended the most effort getting to? Oh, that's a good question. It is a good question. Um, you know, some of this is relative to age. You know, I was diving with my metal detector on Monday, and I, right now I'd say Monday. I was a, <laughs> you know, I'm an old man now, you know, so just suiting up and hiking through the water. Yeah, the wetsuit. Uh, and the wetsuit never gets easy to put on, No, right? it doesn't. They're better than they used to be. Those yeah. old Rubitex things were terrible. But um, um, I would say probably that Port Isabel, which is written about in Lost Below, and you probably have, that's out of print now, but I do have some, so contact me if you want a copy of that. Um, uh, but that Port Isabel was, uh, it took, like I said, 13 years, first of all, to find it. We made a lot of false starts. There was a town on the mainland side of the Mexico called, uh, well, I can't even remember what it's called now. And we went down there, and I thought that that was the original landing, because a lot of times landings will build up. And then I went into this cantina, and um, and this this lady spoke broken English down there, and she, I, there was a porthole hanging up, and I, I said, well, what's that porthole from? And she told me this elaborate story about a shipwreck right off the coast, and there was lifeboats and sharks circling, and then the owner of the cantina came in, 
And I told him, I said, well, she's telling me about your porthole. He said, that porthole? I bought that in L.A. <laughs> so, <laughs> so people tell you a lot of stories, oh, yeah. you know. But that Port Isabel, it took me 13 years to totally find. Um, there's been other times I, I was shipwrecked in the Sea of Cortez one time. I, I had this, this plan that, that we'd tow a canoe out with a Boston whaler. Um, and we'd photograph finback whales, which are there, and they're, they're the second largest whale just below the blue. I, it was really a great plan I had. And then what the Boston whaler would cut us loose in the canoe, there'd be a diver in front with the camera, and I'd paddle the diver up in front of the pod, and he'd photograph the whales. Heck of a plan right up to the point the storm blew up. <laughs> and so, and then it, it broke completely over the whaler's stern, killed the engine, so we had to tie a line from the a canoe the Boston Whaler and tow it ashore, and we were miles from shore. And the surf had picked up, uh, or the swells had picked up just huge, it was just huge. Um, and we couldn't go directly to shore. We were about halfway down the Baja Peninsula. We had to go at an angle, mm -hmm. so we kind of surf down the, the swells rather than get hit sideways. And that was rough. That was, that was uh, towing from paddling with a canoe, a Boston Whaler, miles to shore. That was, that was rough. Yeah, that is rough. And uh, then we were stranded on that beach. And I wish I knew where that beach was. There were um, cliff dwellings. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, but I don't know where I was. We were, we were literally shipwrecked. How'd you get off the beach? Well, finally, um, uh, two of us, there was four of us all together, and uh, two guys, Pete and I, who some of you know Squid Lips Matthews, Squid Lips and I, um, we were the ones paddling the canoe, so we didn't go anywhere. We just laid on the beach. The other two uh, hiked up. Uh, this arroyo, and they found a, uh, they found a, uh, um, uh, a, a ranch, and that guy took him back to uh, Bahia de Los Angeles, and that guy brought down a boat, and hmm. brought us back, and so that's how we got back. Another one was the Jenny Thalen. Jenny Thalen uh, is kind of a neat wreck in the sense that. Um, um, it was the ship that Jack London used as a model for the ghost in the Seawolf. Hmm. And the captain of the Jenny Thalen was Alexander McLean, and he actually used uh, him as a character model for uh, Wolf Larsen in the book. Well, that was wrecked about halfway down Baja on the Pacific side. And so Peter Jensen and I went down there looking for it. And it was just a, rough to get to. You went down about halfway down Baja, then you turn on a dirt road, then you turn on another dirt road for miles and miles, then you turn left where there is no road and put it in four-wheel drive, and you go until you hit the sand dunes, and that's where you pitch your tent. Then you hike over the sand dunes, and there's a beach over there, and that's where we found the Jenny Thalen huh. and um, the remains of it. It was kind of scattered over the beach. Now, we weren't the first... Uh, discoverers, there was this guy who did a lot of research in the 60s on Baja shipwrecks. And when you're doing a, a research on some of these, all you know is he disappears. So I called a guy up in Washington State who had wrote a book about uh, traveling in Baja, asked if he knew anything about it. And he says, yeah. He says, that guy, his wife was having an affair and the boyfriend and his wife killed him and they're in prison in Nevada. <laughs> well, that's why he disappeared so suddenly. <laughs> so he actually discovered the, the Jenny Thalen, the wreck of it, but then, then he disappeared in a lot of his research, so we had an idea where it was, but we didn't know exactly, so we kind of rediscovered it. Huh. Uh, but he was the original discoverer. That is quite the off the beaten path adventure there. Yeah, well, another thing about Mexico travel, on that particular trip, we're driving on this dirt road just miles, and we probably should have had two vehicles. We had Peter Jensen's Pathfinder, which had a quarter million miles on it. Probably should have had a backup vehicle, because we were out there a ways. But all of a sudden, uh, we were pulled over by federales. Well, not pulled over, we were stopped. They just mm -hmm. blocked the, the, uh, the dirt road. Now, we're the only game in town. Uh, we're just literally in the middle of nowhere. And the thing with Mexico is you never know who the good guy or who the bad guy is. You know, that's just the truth. People tell me how safe it is. Yeah, I've traveled thousands of miles through there. And yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. And that's what these guys are. They on the up and up because there's no reason to stop anyone on a dirt road that probably were the only ones that traveled it in the last yeah. 
week or two. I don't know why anyone would go out there. But anyway, they wanted to take everything out and were starting to give us a hard time. So I said, Peter, grab my camera. It was sitting on the dashboard. So I put my arm around this, this Federale and Peter took a picture. And that just stopped everything. It just de-escalated everything. That really made him nervous. And I don't know why I even did it other than we were running out of things to do. But I have this picture of me with, <laughs> I'm smiling, he's going, okay. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, I, 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 that just, they just left after that. I guess they figured that. Yeah, don't know what happened. But, oh, who uh, knows? Who knows what was the motivation behind all that? I right? don't know, but that's yeah. what happened on that Jenny Thalen trip. It was a little bit. Oh, and the other thing that happened on that trip is I'm not, I'm not much of a drinker, but I did have a, a beer over the campfire with our tent and stuff with Peter at night and stuff, which means I got to get up in the middle of the night and get rid of the beer. And so I went over to this cactus and went back into the tent. Well, that morning, uh, right around our tent, the cactus were mountain lion prints about this big. And the yeah. mountain lion came down the beach to feed, I guess, at night. But um, while I'm standing, the, the next night when you're standing out in the cactus, you sure think about that mountain lion print. <laughs> I'd say. So. Hopefully yeah, there's no uh, jumping, uh, what, what are they called? Jumping choyas. Jumping choyas <laughs> yeah, out there, no right? There's no jumping choyas on that. All trip. right, next question, Andy. Can you talk a little bit more about your process? How do you find the stories that you do? And then how do you go about researching them? Well, I'll go backwards on that. Researching them it runs the gamut. You know, the internet is a good source, but but it's certainly not a perfect source. Um, the internet, in fact, I've taken specialized uh, seminars on on doing in investigation via the internet um, through the Society of Professional Journalists because it's so difficult. For everything that's true on the internet, there's something that's untrue, and there's just it's just hard to know. So you have to back up everything you you find on the internet, but it is a good place to start uh, with most things. Uh, if it's a, like an airplane accident, well, there's actual uh, reports, uh, like even going back to World War One or World War Two. There's reports uh, on these, and you can find the actual accident reports. Um, uh, Steve, Chris, and I were diving a, a P-38 in Corsair that crashed into each other in 1944 off the coast, and we have the actual reports uh, from both the Marine Corps, who owned the Corsair, ran the Corsair, and the Navy, or uh, the Army, who uh, ran the uh, P-38. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll give you uh, some information. Uh, there's two, when you get into investigation, there's two entirely different Ways. I don't know if this answers your question or not. If in investigative journalism, what you do is you create a hypothesis, um, and then you go out to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Um, I don't particularly like that method. Uh, in investigation, uh, we'll go back to Sherlock Holmes, that's deductive reasoning, where what you do is you collect all your facts, just keep on collecting information, and that will lead you to the story rather than come up with an early hypothesis, which will oftentimes create a bias because you want mm -hmm. to prove yourself right. You right. Know? And so I prefer deductive reasoning, and that's how I investigate things. Um, what was the other first part of that? No, where do I get the leads? And, yeah, where do you get the leads from? Uh, you know, all over the place. You know, um, I, I started... Uh, like I said, looking for stuff a long time ago, and then you wind up in a little circle of people like uh, uh, Steve Lawson, who's a huge researcher of shipwrecks, and uh, uh, Pat Maka, who runs a Project Remembrance, and they uh, uh, research and look for, uh, uh, for lost aircraft. And it was just a couple of years ago, I went out with Pat Maka's team, and we found a B-25 bomber in the mountains that had never been discovered. Hmm. I mean, so there's stuff out there all over that hasn't been discovered. The real problem with most of this stuff is this guarantee, like that, that where that um, bomber uh, crashed, is there's no trails going to this stuff. So you're, you're bushwhacking through a, a lot of uh, tough territory to get to it. And generally, anything that goes in the ocean, every shipwreck always sinks in deep, 
dark, ugly water. They <laughs> never, you know, I've been in the Caribbean and South Pacific, and those are pretty wrecks and stuff, but the real wrecks, what you're looking for, they're always in just the worst place known to man. Right. So some of this is kind of tough. And before someone tries some of this stuff, well, you know, back, uh, I joined California Wreck Divers in 1974, and before that I started diver training. And, uh, you know, I, I went through a lot of classes all the way through a certified dive master and rescue diver and all this stuff. You know, you have to really have your underwater uh, skills honed before you go in and dive a shipwreck in two-foot visibility because uh, that's dangerous stuff. Anytime you go into an overhead environment or a bunch of obstructions, we were just uh, doing a National Geographic uh, special on the Mon Falcone, which is covered with fishnets, and it's oftentimes limited visibility. And uh, that can be very dangerous to dive into something, and you don't know it, but you swim underneath fishnets and stuff. So I wouldn't suggest anyone going out looking for some of this stuff without really a lot of training on yeah. it. So this didn't happen overnight. All right, next question. Before we get to the next question, Steve Lawson wants us to know that the Salton Sea is at minus 226 feet of elevation. So thank you for that clarification, Steve. So yeah. if they cut a channel in, it would get substantially bigger. It would flood India. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thanks a lot, Steve. And also, thanks for so staying you, on the boat while I went, made that dive. You, but, I mean, still not impossible, right? To, to Steve's point, yeah. That, locks. That, with locks, you with, could do yeah, that. Yeah, so with some locks, you could bring the boats yeah. down. And, again, getting all that yeah. ship traffic out of L.A. would be huge. And well, that's, Think yeah. about how much yeah. wide open space you would have to stack your containers and warehouse crap. Oh, yeah. You know? Well, that's a, salt and sea, like I said, Lynn and I have gone down there. The first time I was looking for... Um, uh, for the Navy base down there. They have a, sea, uh, a seaplane base down there, and I wanted to find the base. And actually, the original road from the World War II base is still there. And there's a float, like a little tower thing floating out there. Well, that was the target they used um, when they practiced um, on dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Really? They, yeah, they, there was a Navy base there, and they practiced in the Salton Sea, but the target... Last time I checked, the little target was still floating out there oh, that they that's used. Cool. Yeah, and that's something to go see. Well, you know, that's another little thing. There's history all over the place. There's stuff, and so how many people go by the Salton Sea and there's a thing floating there? And don't think a thing about it. Um, perhaps, uh, well, if I do something different, it would be I want to know what that tower is for. Yeah, you know, what's the story behind it? So, I don't know if if there's a secret to that. Um, I was having my oil changed uh, not too long ago, and I, I don't know how we got talking to the guy changing my oil. And he says, yeah, there's an old stone up there. I've never seen it, but, you know, I rode my motorcycle up there, but then I, it got too steep, so I just went home. I, so I, yeah, I walked up there just by myself. I scheduled, put on my list of stuff to do, walked up there. Well, there's an old stone. They figure it's about 10,000 years old, and it's carved with petroglyphs. Um, and nobody knows what it means, what it's for. They call it the maze stone because it looks like it's actually a, like a corn maze or something drawn on it. Yeah. But it's like 10,000 years old, out in the middle of nowhere, not too far from my house, actually. That's interesting. So the guy who changed my oil told me about that. That's actually on my bucket list, is to build something like that in the middle of nowhere for no, no reason. Drive people like me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> just, I, I, I got Nevada pegged, like I want to get something out in Nevada yeah. and erect something, like some sort of monument, maybe point it at some stars, align it, oh. and, and scratch some aliens into it, and sure. then just leave it. But the, the point of this, and I think I might have brought it up on this before, is I, I, I want to make sure that whatever I build, you know, barring like anything super catastrophic, would last for like 10,000 years. So long enough that like someone could come out 10,000 years later and be like, what is this? Really Why were people it. here? What did oh, they know? Were there funny. aliens? That looks like an alien, yeah. you know? Just yeah. a 10,000 year old long game practical joke. Yeah, it's probably Chaco Canyon. I can't Canyon. be the first person Chaco to come up Canyon with that Chaco Canyon is probably the first practical joke. The, <laughs> the whole thing is meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question, right, Andy? Two more questions. Two more questions, I can okay. choose one if you want. Uh, the next question is, 
Over the course of your adventures, you've mentioned you've gone with a few people, members of the other members of the club. What do each of those guys bring to the table in terms of an adventure? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, a lot of these, the people I've been with were the same guys, like Steve Lawson and I. We've been diving together for yeah, probably 30 years now. Um, Peter Jensen and I, uh, probably similar. Squid Lips Matthews, uh, he goes back 50 years. We were diving Squid together. Lips? Yeah, his real name is Pete. And I, I wrote this, it was like a serial, it was kind of a joke um, about this fanciful guy. Uh, Buck Fantod, who went looking for shipwrecks and treasure and stuff, and Squidlips Matthews was his wonder buddy. This is all just a joke. Well, people liked it, so I wound up writing, I think it was 38 episodes of this, and each time I wrote an episode, I had to get him out of the problem. I just get him in a problem, not thinking how I'm going to get him out of this dilemma. So it was kind of the silly thing, but the name Squidlips actually stuck. Huh. Um, and often is, is abbreviated just to lips. <laughs> so for years now, he's been known as Squid Lips Matthews. So. That's funny. Anyway, old diving buddy from So what, is, what, what does Steve bring to the table? He's a well, diver, Steve, right? Yeah, Steve's a diver, Put and he's a hardcore shipwreck researcher where clearly I get sidetracked all the time. Uh, Steve focuses very much on shipwrecks and things like this. Uh, he's super tech savvy when it comes. He's a tech diver. Uh, I think he's certified down to 300 feet. Um, and he is much more technical than I am. Um, he helped me put these photos on a stupid flash drive because I couldn't figure out how to do it on my computer. So um, when we're planning out something like Port Isabel, something where you have to go to this waypoint and then head this heading to this waypoint to this waypoint and then you're matching this up with satellite photos. Steve is great at that sort of stuff. And, and I can do it and I've been successful at it, but he does it with a lot more ease than I do. I'm struggling with, with technology sometimes. Do you think Steve would be a good person to have in here to interview? Oh yeah, as far as shipwrecks um, yeah. and stuff, yeah, he, he really is a, a great diver great shipwreck researcher, and also uh, Peter Jensen is too. Peter Jensen is writing a book right now that I'm helping uh, edit on the shipwrecks of Baja, and he's the guy. We were just talking just the other day about Isla Tiburon going out there, and I don't know, it might be, a, this is getting harder. I'm 71 years old, and you talk about pulling an inflatable boat on a dirt road, turn to sand, have to lift it off, take the 94-pound motor off, hoist all the diving stuff, then hoist the 300-pound. Um, some of these trips, I, I'm, I'm starting to question whether it's good for a 71-year-old to be doing this. Maybe but, you just need to take a different role on the expedition. Yeah, you know, Not well, the 94-pound motor-carrying guy. And I just thought about it. That's what grandkids have always been for. Yeah. So I, I got grandkids to haul that boat to the water's edge and stuff. So you could get like a lawn chair that had two poles going through it, and you could, yeah. if you had four grandkids, they could yeah. carry you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's getting better all the time. Or a lot of balloons, a lot of heat. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All right, last question, Andy. Final question of the night. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and for asking the questions. I hope to see you all next week. Uh, in addition to the answer that you just gave, Dave, uh, Steve Lawson wants to chime in with, I taught Dave everything he knows. <laughs> well, that's going a bit far. <laughs> you know, Steve, I, I Steve's wanna, about my kid's age. <laughs> I want to say, Steve Lawson, if you taught him everything he knows, you need to sit in that chair, too, and get interviewed here. Yeah, he'd I know, be a good uh, one. I know he's listening. So, yeah, Steve, no, he, he'd be a good one. I, he's got, there's an email coming your way about scheduling you to come in. Yeah, no, he'd be a good one to talk to. He knows a lot about shipwrecks. And, and like I said, we've had ventures all over the place. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so he's got some stories. Cool. All right, Andy, last question? Last question of the night. Bring it home. Uh, what advice do you have for anyone who wants to do what you do? Well, uh, number one, I've had a tendency business-wise to buy high and sell low, so I'm not sure I'm going to give you business advice. Um, the way I make money at this is by writing, and so some people um, um, are a little idealistic about treasure hunting, that they're going to go out and find something and, and be, be rich and 
uh, that's that's the end of it. Uh, but I do, um, if you're going to do this sort of thing, uh, there's a lot of knowledge involved. And back to that other question, you know, you surround yourself with people who know things. Um, and uh, uh, but you know, I got certified, you know, in I think it was life saving, uh, first aid. CPR. I mean, there's a lot of things because you have to be self-sufficient. So as long as you feel confident in being self-sufficient out there, I, I think you're okay. But in a lot of these places, you're out in the middle of nowhere, and if things go bad, and they can go bad, and they have gone bad, uh, you better have a plan B and, and able to, to perform that plan B. Um, uh, and you don't have a lot of time to think about it. So... Um, so a lot of it's education. If you if you plan on diving, uh, don't just get certified. Get, become the best diver you can be. And if you plan on going deep, then make sure you're you're qualified to go deep and you know what you're doing. But if you plan on going like in the middle of Mexico or something where nobody is, then you better have your your ducks in a row as far as the equipment you take and your knowledge. Um, and then I would highly recommend it. I think, I think today I'm just surprised that so many younger people aren't going out there. Like I said, there's stuff and adventures all over the place, uh, not just in the water, but you, you walk down your street, and like I said, just down from my house, I, I found that, that maze stone that's 10,000 years old that hardly anyone knows anything about, and they don't have the history of it. I haven't done a lot of research on it yet, but according to local history, uh, a historical society, they don't know what it is, who did it. They're aware of it, though? They're aware of it. And so, um, uh, so there's stuff all over the place. Um, and so um, I get this COVID-19 thing is slowing people up. But as soon as that's over, I ought to hop in a car and go have an adventure. Go find something yeah. lost. Well, I mean, the only thing that COVID really changed about it is you got to pack a lunch, right? You that's can't really true. Stop. You, I mean, you true. Can, now, now you can a little bit more, but... You, you know, you can't stop at a diner and have have food or whatever. Or yeah, it makes it more difficult. Yeah. But um, but I mean, if you're self sufficient anyway. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Pack what you I, need. I have a, 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 a pickup truck with the old style uh, camper, aluminum camper, in the windows and stuff, which I've slept in any number of times, and uh, it's an old style uh, camper like you'd see in the sixties or fifties, but I had a custom made for the truck. Is it one of those ones that you see wobbling. Well, no, it doesn't <laughs> wobble. <laughs> like you go around a turn and hit a bump and it's kind of like this no. off the back? Well, or is it one of the streamlined ones? But no, it's not streamlined. Oh, so it pops <laughs> it's, up it's like you can, you can walk in it, right? No, no, it's not that tall, okay. but, but it's old style aluminum. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, um, but yeah, I throw my sleeping bag back in there and uh, diving. And there's stuff, like I said, all over. Um, I was diving uh, Lake Havasu uh, uh, just uh, uh, a month ago. And uh, I brought my, my uh, DPV, diver propulsion uh, vehicle, where I could blow, I reversed it, propped up against some rocks so I could excavate, I could blow a hole in the sand looking for stuff. And it, I didn't find a whole lot that time, but I've dove there where I found gold rings sitting on top of rocks, just sitting there. Yeah. And uh, I bet Havasu's got a lot of junk like that that people drunkenly drop in they do the people and uh, a weird thing about that place other places too but that place in particular i was in this canyon one time and i was metal detecting right near this where people um, uh, put their boats on on the sand and every foot or so i found a key ring with full of keys so i don't know how anyone ever got out of there let alone home i had their car keys <laughs> But it was every foot I found a key ring. That's crazy. So the, the secret to that, and probably I should just end on this, is don't drink and don't do drugs and go on the water because you'll lose your keys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the craziest thing about Havasu, though, I have to say, is that they bought the London Bridge they did. and put it there. <laughs> they did. <laughs> the literal yeah. London Bridge from London. And, yeah, and, go and, figure. <laughs> yeah. That's the craziest thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, Dave, thank you for coming out. Certainly. Uh, we appreciate it. This is a great, great talk. Um, these stories are just amazing. Totally off the beaten path, totally on brand for the Adventurers Club. Yeah, well, sorry I got sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's part of the story, right? And, I guess And it I is. think if there's anything about the process of how you get leads, 
that was it, right? You kind of get sidetracked and I you do. pick that up and put it on your list to yeah. investigate. Yeah, keep my ears open and yeah. you hear these little stories. You know? So for those of you watching, thanks for watching our channel. If you like these stories, uh, make sure you um, like the video, share it with your friends on Facebook and Instagram and wherever you're sharing stuff. Uh, subscribe to the channel and pick up some of Dave's books available on Kim Kindle. And I bet Andy already has the links in the description. He does. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully you get some books uh, out to some people and they'll be able to enjoy these stories. That'd be great. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thank, Thank you all you, for Rich. watching. And we'll see you next week.